Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the hard board meeting of November 2nd, 2020. For the first time, our meeting format is hybrid. We have a quorum physically present at the county center and the rest of the board members uh, are participating virtually. We're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you're not in a room with a flag, you can see an image of the flag displayed on your screens. So please join me now in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, Mr. Brewer, is there some problem why staff uh, is not cannot take attendance? Call the roll. Yes, ma'am. We had a technical snag there. We are ready now. And okay. yeah, you can go ahead and call the roll. Thank you. Yell from Hart. Please say here after your name is called. Director Castor. Here. Director Hudson. Here. Director Johnson. Here. Director Kemp. Director Knight. Here. Director McLean. Here. Director Overman. Here. Director Schisler. Here. Director Smith or Chair Smith, I apologize. That's fine. Here. Director Frazier. Here. Director Vieira. Madam Chair, you do have quorum. Um, at this point, Hart General Counsel Julia Mandel will read into the record our rules for participation in the virtual meeting. Good morning, Ms. Mandel. That there is a quorum physically present in the room um, on the 26th floor of the Hillsborough County Center. Um, so that that is clear for the record. Uh, thank you for your participation in this hybrid meeting. This meeting requires a physical quorum, which is present in the physical location of County Center 601 East Kennedy Boulevard, 26th floor. The rest of the board members have chosen to participate virtually. For those participating virtually, please keep your devices and phones muted when not speaking. Muting the sound and, the mi on, and microphone on your device helps avoid feedback. You may enable the video camera on your device, but please discontinue all personal conversations for the duration of the meeting. Note that the quality of your video will depend on your internet connection. Please follow along with a copy of the meeting agenda and materials sent via email. All presentations will be shared on screen while presented for all meeting participants. Roll call has been taken for attendance and will be taken for voting by hard staff. Quorum and voting results will be announced. There will be an opportunity for members of the public who have pre-registered with HART staff to provide comments 
I understand that there is no um, public comment and nobody has registered to speak, although I understand there are some some people who are watching uh, the meeting. So I just wanted to make that clear for the record. Um, since there is no uh, pu public comment, um, I'm not going to go ahead and read the public comment participation rules. When you want to provide a comment or ask a question, please signal that you want to speak by activating the hand button, which is in the white circle next to your name on your screen. And that is for both those who are attending in person and those who are attending virtually. The hand will turn blue when activated. The names of raised hands will be called in order for the chair to acknowledge, then the participant may unmute their device or mic and speak. Please speak your name before you comment. Presenters, please note that all presentations will be controlled by hard staff. Ensure that your name, title, company, organization is stated for the record. Please say next slide when needed and staff will progress through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mandel. Uh, board members, we have a very full agenda today. A full three and a half hours is scheduled for the four presentations of the CEO candidates, along with our discussions on that item. And we have several additional items of business we need to take care of today. So let's all try to be as brief as possible in our remarks as we go through this agenda. And everyone, please feel free to eat lunch. I understand that there are some snacks in the boardroom, um, wh wherever you are, um, take care of yourselves and we'll get through this long meeting. Please note that item number 11, the CEO interviews are scheduled for time certain, starting at 10 a.m. So wherever we are in the agenda at 10 a.m., we will skip ahead to that item. So. Let's see how much we can get done before 10 a.m. Item number two, approval of the minutes. No, uh, we, have, <laughs> we have two okay. sets to approve and uh, as noted in your agenda. So that motion to approve both sets of minutes by Commissioner Overman, seconded by Commissioner Kemp. Any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Arthur, please take a roll call vote. Thank you very much, Director Castor. Yes. Director Hudson. Yes. Director Director. Director Kemp. Yes. Right. Yes. Director McLean. Yes. Director Overman. Yes. Director Schistler. Yes. Director Smith. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Director Frazier. Yes. Director Vieira. Yes. Director Williams. Unanimously. Thank you. Great, and um, so that motion passed. Uh, public input, I understand, and I'll confirm one more time for the record with staff that there is no one uh, pre-registered who wishes to comment on our meeting today. That is correct, Madam Chair, thank you. Great, okay. Um, recognition of outgoing board members. Um, Mr. Adam Harden was appointed to the Hart Board of Directors by the County Commission in 2017. During his three-year term on the Hart Board, Director Hardin served as Hart Board appointee on the MPO and the Tampa Historic Streetcar Board. He chaired Hart Finance and Audit Committee, served on the Transit-Oriented Development Ad Hoc Committee, the Claims and Litigation Committee, and was a member of the Affordable Housing Advisory Board. Mr. David Mechanic is Hart's longest serving Hart board member from 1995 when Governor Lawton Childs appointed him to the board. Mr. Mechanic was Hart board chair in 1998. He served again from 2002 to 2012, during which time he was chair again in the years 2004 and 2005. Most recently, David Mechanic served as the Hillsborough County appointee for three years from 2017 to 2020. Mr. Mechanic is not a sprinter, he's a heart marathoner. During his last term on the heart board, Director Mechanic served as our appointee on the MPO and the Tampa Historic Streetcar Board, of which he was a co founder. He chaired the Claims and Litigation Committee and the Transit-Oriented Development Committee, and he served on the Finance and Audit Committee and the Operations and Safety Committee. And that brings us to Commissioner Les Miller, 
who joined the Heart Board of Directors in November of 2016. He was elected Heart Board Chair in just a few months of his service on the board. And in January 2017, um, was and, and then he was reelected to chair and continued chairing the board through July uh, 2020. All three of these outgoing members will receive a crystal bus in honor of their de dedication. And if you've ever seen that, that's a beautiful memento. And I, I know I speak for all of us in saying all three of these board members deserve more time than we can give them on our agenda today. But we hope you will keep in touch and continue helping us with your suggestions and ideas as we all work together to move transit forward in our community. Mr. Hardin, Mr. Mechanic, and Commissioner Miller, thank you all for your years of service on the board. Uh, and I don't see e any one of those with us today. So uh, that is our, that constitutes our farewell to those uh, board members who have served hard so well. Thank you. And that brings us to welcoming our new board members. On November 21st, the County Commission made its citizen appointments to the Hart Board of Directors. And I would like to welcome back Director Marvin Knight, <laughs> who was reappointed for a second three-year term. And we will welcome aboard two new board members, Eric Johnson and Rena upshaw Frazier. You can find their bio, bios in your packet under section five. And on behalf of the directors and staff of HART, let me say that we all extend a warm welcome to you both. And uh, thank you for stepping up to serve HART. And thank you, Director Knight, for step, stepping back up to serve another term. Um, Mr. Johnson, uh, would you like to say a very quick hello? I'll definitely be brief. I'll, on my first day, I don't want to get the chair mad at me for dragging on too long, but I'll quickly, I, I look forward to working with all of you. I think that we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff to do here and I'm looking forward to being able to uh, move the organization forward and I'll, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, really being able to learn from everybody here and I'll hopefully we'll be able to get a lot, a lot of things done together. That, and that's all I have. Thank you very much. And Ms. Frazier, um, would you like to say hello? Everyone, I really appreciate um, the appointment to the board as a Hillsborough County resident, um, native resident, and a longtime resident of Brandon. I consider it an honor to be here, and um, I, I really look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you both for um, volunteering to join this board. It's a lot of work, but it's very rewarding. Um, and that takes us to uh, a board appointment. Um, now that Director Hardin's term has ended, we have a vacancy for a member and an alternate on the Affordable Housing Advisory Board. Um, before we open that up, um, Commissioner Overman, you are the chair of that board. Um, I was thinking that most of our appointments can wait until elections and we see um, we may be welcoming more board members on in uh, just a couple of weeks. Are, are you sure that um, that we should go ahead and make that this appointment today rather than waiting. Um, I appreciate that consideration. Um, one, um, there is a very robust agenda with the Affordable Housing Advisory Board that is moving forward in the fourth quarter as well as the first quarter. And as this is a, a position that is a representative of the transit agency, right now that's that's a big deal. Um, as you know, uh, this meeting along with the Affordable Housing Advisory Board were uh, actually scheduled at the same time when I came into office and I thought it might be a good idea to separate the two because it was critically important that we had 
um, the connection between affordable housing and transit is being part of our smart growth plan. Um, we have had, our current members have had some, uh, have indicated some interest. And so, well, I uh, believe that, yes, the board may change. Um, I think it would also be very helpful for us to have that position filled before February, which means if we if we don't do it today, we won't have a position um, with a voice of heart uh, mission until then. So that's why I asked to put it on today's agenda and would invite those that are interested in the position to, to offer um, their commitment to the process as, as we can bring it forward today. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, and, and thanks for letting me put you on the spot just to clarify um, why, why we're moving forward with this appointment uh, today. Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, I, I really think we should be uh, putting this off till um, January for a few reasons. We will have shifts on the board. It looks like this position um, began uh, in November of 2019, and it ends in November of 2022. Um, and I had heard at first that we were just doing this for a few months, but uh, this would be for two years to come, apparently. And I really think at this point, it would be unwise as well. I think the kind of heart um, presence that is needed on the Affordable Housing Board is one of understanding the transit system more technical uh, presence um, than a uh, board presence would be, um, I think, advisable, like as I find is true in a lot of different boards that we have, where it's more not a voting board member, but kind of more an advisory and technical presence that's needed um, at, at the, actually at all. But um, I would really, um, be, uh, I, I would really uh, ask um, Commissioner Overman to, um, you know, put this off until December, uh, January, when we figure out our our board, because I think it would be really important to to really have a, a chance um, to consider this carefully. All right, and. Um... Without seeing any further discussion, uh, I think uh, Commissioner Overman has made her position clear, is correct? And um, we will move ahead. Um, so Ms. Mandel, Hart General Counsel, will lead, lead us through the election process. Like, yes, um, first I would call for any nominations from the, the board for uh, the uh, person to serve on the Affordable Housing Advisory Board as the Hart representative. So I'd ask for nom a nomination. Uh, uh, this is Director McLean. I nominate Director Hudson uh, if he is willing, of course, as always. So, so if necessary. So for the record, uh, Director Hudson has been nominated and there has been a second. Are there any other nominations? Hearing that there are no other nominations, um, I would ask that there be an action of the board to um, uh, place uh, Director Hudson as the heart representative on the uh, uh, Affordable Housing Advisory Board. an action on that. Uh, Vera moves. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, Ms. Mandel, I think you're, you still have the floor. Um, I think at this point, Ms. Arthur needs to call for the vote, uh, to, to ask for the vote. Good morning, this is Danielle from Hart. Please say yes or no after your name is. Yes. I apologize, I had to switch mics. Uh, 
Director Johnson? Yes. Director Kemp? Yes. Director Knight? Yes. Director McLean? Yes. Director Overman? Yes. Director Schistler? Yes. Chair Smith? Yes. Director Frazier? Yes. Director Vieira? Yes. And Director Williams? Uh, would you, would you voted on it? We're voting on affordable housing, uh, Tyler Hudson to be a member of the Affordable Housing Committee. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Chair. Thank you very much. Sure. And thank you very much, uh, Director Hudson, for uh, your willingness to serve Hart on the Affordable Housing Board. And we appreciate that. Um, okay. There's the consent agenda. Um, any questions by board members for staff on these items or a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve the consent agenda by Commissioner Over I mean, Director Overman. <laughs> Do I have a <laughs> We're having difficulty hearing those in the boardroom. Consent agenda, is there a second? Mr. McLean seconded. Great. Um, so we've got a motion by Commissioner Overman, uh, seconded by Director McLean. Please take a roll call vote for the consent agenda. Yes. Director Castor? Yes. Director Hudson? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Kemp? Yes. Director Knight? Yes. Director McLean? Yes. Director Overman? Yes. Director Schistler? Yes. Chair Smith? Yes. Director Frazier? Yes. Frazier. Director Vieira? Yes. Director Williams? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that brings us to item eight, our legislative priorities for uh, fiscal year 2021. Ms. Lorena Hardwick, Director of Government Relations, will lead us through this Item, uh, Mr. Har Ms. Hardwick, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair Smith. Just making sure everyone can hear me. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, in front of you, and I'm trying to look at my screen here to see if the presentation is up, but in front of you, you shortly have the PowerPoint uh, presentation to talk a little bit about our local state policy advocacy. We did talk about this at the committee level. We uh, briefed uh, Director Kemp. We brought it over to the Legislative uh, Legislative Affairs and Strategic Planning Committee. And what we're asking today um, of our board is just to, uh, we'll quickly go through these, but we will ask that you please approve this and that you uh, go forward as our partner and moving uh, forward in the upcoming legislative season. Um, as we have stated in the past, this is not a one year done list. This is an overview of what the current needs are. Obviously, we will be having an election uh, taking place tomorrow. So, as we move forward with this, um, we have to take into account that uh, even if uh, the current administration states, there will be some changes on the federal level and that we will have some um, new priorities or some new, not priorities, but some new uh, funding opportunities at the federal level. Uh, next page, please. On the local uh, side of things, we will be looking uh, for uh, local and state partnerships when we are looking forward to our electric charging stations. I know that electric vehicles are one of the things that we will be looking forward to in this upcoming year. We won't uh, have a contract for, for electric buses. So looking to see what quarters those buses are running and finding some incentive to help us with the charging station. Next slide, please. These are the, the next upcoming slides will showcase the two statutes that we will be closely looking at at the state level. Um, we are looking to try to make transit more of an eligible and prioritized um, funding, specifically through the strategic intermodal system. Next slide, please. 
And then we are looking to do some amendments and have conversations around uh, statute 341.303. And specifically when we're looking at rail, um, anywhere where it says rail in this particular statute, we are hoping to work with our local and regional partners. This has been an initiative many of you have seen through the transportation management uh, with the TMA, looking at fixed skyway projects and opening that up again, to try to be creative and find different funding avenues um, for transit so that it not all has to come up through the transportation fund um, and FDOT. Next slide, please. As we move forward, HART is going to be looking at our radio communications project. Internally, this has uh, been identified as a priority. With Super Bowl coming up, we wanna make sure that as we work with our partners at the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, uh, we are able to leverage their 17 antennas. Currently, HART um, has access to one antenna, so there will be a level of redundancy if we're able to partner with HCSO um, to make our radio communications um, more robust. Our studies that we are be look be looking forward to, um, CSX and our BRT studies, and of course, we'd like to maintain a uh, Fairfield streetcar service um, in the next uh, couple of years. Next slide, please. And this is just our bread and butter. These are the grants that HART always goes for. These are some of the grants that we have been very successful in the last couple of years. Buses of facility, low to no emission. We will definitely be placing a priority on the maintenance facility, our own uh, maintenance building, and you know how we can move forward and find dollars uh, to either rebuild and or uh, remodel and expand. And then here are some of the other grant opportunities that currently exist um, that would be beneficial for HART, but again, these are going to always flow. If there are, um, next slide, please. Just uh, wanted to say thank you. Um, I know that this, you know, this is always uh, kind of a, a moving target. Um, I will say that at the state level, radio communications will be a priority. We'll be looking at uh, very creative ways to try and garner some dollars for that particular project. And uh, we will have the support, of course, of our legislative partners at Holland and Knight. Um, but if there are no questions, I uh, would love for the board to uh, uh, partner. Move approval. <laughs> Uh, this is Commissioner Director Overman. I'll move approval. <laughs> Motion for approval. Um, do I have a second? Second, Pierre. Pierre, okay. Approval by Commissioner Overman, a second by Councilman Vieira. Uh, Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Commissioner Kemp, yeah. You're muted, Commissioner Kemp. Thank you. This came through the policy committee earlier. When it came through the policy committee, it said something like amending a statute without naming the statute and without talking about what kind of amendments that would be. So um, I asked for clarification on that and I got it. And if we could put up um, three, uh, uh, the statute, the slide you had with uh, 341 on it, Ms. Hardwick. Because I want to discuss that. We'll get there. There, we passed it. 341. Okay. So, I think this is really significant to ask to do this, uh, to ask to amend 341. And it was an action that was taken um, a couple years ago as well, pushed by Tibarda. Um, and so amending this, this what this statute does is it creates funding for Miami's Tri-Rail and Orlando Sun-Rail, of which I would like to join them with our CSX rail. And that's what we have stated as a board is a priority. However, this would change that. Um, and I can tell you first off that I went to see Lynx and Sunrail 
a couple years ago and afterwards a committee in Orlando met with me and I was rather taken aback. They knew I was on T-BARDA and, and we describe as having regional partners, but they consider us very hostile because T-BARDA was pushing this to try to take away their funding for their SunRail and for the tri-rail programs. I don't understand why we're not, why we are attacking this funding source that they value and that we should also value as them being part of our region, rather than trying to attempt to do a new funding source for BRT. The other thing is, is what is designed here would not help Hillsborough County one little bit. Um, it says intercity rail or intercity fixed guideway. Intercity is between cities. We do not have a project between cities. We are unique in the state of Florida for only having three jurisdictions, Tampa, Temple Terrace, and Plant City. These other places like Miami-Dade, Broward, uh, Palm Beach, and Pinellas have 20, 30, 40 places that they could put this BRT. We have right now the brt project that we're serious about from usf to downtown that we're moving ahead it would not be eligible for funding under this um, we don't have intercity brt here that could benefit by this this is when i asked about it they said this is something that pinellas would like but this is not something that would benefit us this change in particular in any way we could not get funding for our brt and we would lose possible funding for our CSX um, as we moved ahead. So I, I would make a motion that we would move this forward, the legislative agenda, but for um, removing the 341 for further discussion for the future um, and how we might want to do that or uh, work in that. So that my motion would be to move it ahead with the legislative agenda, but to- Excuse me, your motion is to amend, I believe. Because there's uh, yes. a motion on, a, on the floor to approve. Right. So you mo you're moving to amend it to remove uh, this part. Right. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that's just okay. That's okay. That's my motion is to amend to remove this in particular because I think this wouldn't. In fact, I know this does not benefit us in any way, and in fact, takes away an opportunity for us. So it's not something that Hillsborough County. Um, should be um, uh, seeking. Thank you. So we have a motion to amend the um, proposed legislative priorities to remove this one uh, uh, bit of it. Um, is there that would remove this bit about um, amending applicable statutes to create new funding allocations for fixed guideway projects uh, under this state statute, 341.303, uh, essentially asking to um, add projects rather than rail, expand the funding opportunities uh, to, to projects other than rail. Do we have a second? But I, I say also importantly, only intercity, that word, but go ahead, I'm sorry. Right, exactly. So do we have a second to the motion to amend by pulling out this one thing? Director McLean, um, I have a question, not not a second. Um, looking for a second before we uh, continue with discussion. Yes, sir, I'll second for discussion only. Uh, or, um, Councilman Schisler. Um Director, Let's see, in order, um, but go ahead, Director McClain, you're recognized. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, if in fact this is, as Commissioner Kemp mentioned, then, then I'm a little dismayed that it's on the agenda, but I wanna make sure that her claims that we could not use these funds um, is a valid claim. And so I'll, I'll reach back to our legislative representative there to either validate it is or isn't. Um, because I'm under the assumption that it is something we could use. Um, also, um, I've been tracking SunRail over in Orlando too. They're up at they're they're past their seven year point, or will be coming up on their seven year point. Um, so the funding, or let me put it this way, that pot of money is somewhat up 
for, uh, I won't say grabs, but it's, it's available for amending. So just if we can validate that is the case as opposed to going through the whole process of, of voting um, so we know which one is which. Ms. Uh, Hardwick. This is, this is the conversation that I've had and, you know, these have been taking place um, for a while at the TMA. And what are some of the things that we as a region and as partners with um, other entities can support um, that would allow for uh, just opportunities for growth and expansion? Uh, the way that I see it and the way, or at least the way that it was, has been explained and uh, the conversations that I've had is expanding it to include, um, to not just be rail, but to um, include the guide, you know, the, the guideways uh, would be beneficial for the transit agencies. Uh, yes, uh, Director Kemp is correct that there are absolutely more benefits um, to other regions. Um, Hillsborough County right now, we don't have uh, BRT that goes from here into Temple Terrace, the BRT that goes from here into Plant City. Is that something in the future that, you know, could happen? Maybe. Um, but as it stands, again, we were just looking at avenues where it could expand a statute and expand a particular funding mechanism, not to try and take away from others, but, and I get that, right? Like you're, you're sharing, we're now sharing. But in expanding it, um, the idea would be that more funding um, could potentially roll through that area if we're looking at, you know, rail, but we're also looking at a fixed guideway. Um, so expanding that definition that it shouldn't just be rail, but it can also include um, buses. Thank you. Mr. McLean, does that answer your question? Uh, it, yes, it does. And and. Just to further the discussion, I mean, I'm an advocate for pursuing any areas that would possibly open up funding sources for us. I know rail is a contentious issue, um, and I understand CSX and the need for it here. However, I think we're a ways away from that. Um, but uh, I, I, for one, would look at this and say, yes, we ought to proceed with this because it does provide one more avenue for us to, to pursue for funding for for heart and for transit within the uh, the local community. Thank you. Thank you. And so I'm just realizing that the name I see here for Corbin is you, Mr. McLean, correct? Yes, I'm alias Corbin today. Thank you. All right, thank you. And um, there we go. And Commissioner Overman, you're recognized. Thank you. And and I do, I do appreciate um, Director or Commissioner Kemp's um, comments. I, I think uh, having our legislative team make recommendations to increase participation and eligibility, whether it be for rail or, or BRT or uh, commuter rail related projects, um, is is what we're looking for here, and to make sure that we're putting appropriations at the top of the list for funding so that we could in fact move several items forward for example our csx project and study so I, i'm not sure having inner city uh, as, is as uh, detrimental as it may appear um so, so i but i again I, I mean i'll defer to your to your expertise here but i'm not sure this would preclude us from participating given that we only have three cities because it does say or <laughs> and um and it is a specific uh, appropriation goal that we have in moving our csx study forward and being able to begin uh, preparing for a, um you know a start of fta starts grant so i i'm i'm still questioning that and i appreciate your your input there thank you thank you um du uh, director williams you're recognized uh, my question was answered earlier from Mr. McLean asked a similar question. I think I'm satisfied. Thank you. I'll, I'll hand down. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, I can tell you that I, I very specifically um, through the MPO researched this same issue, asked what, how this came up, and I was told because 
Pinellas wants to pay, which they can, they want to get resources for their St. Pete to the beaches, BRT, I'm all about it. But we do not benefit by this at all, by the word intercity being on there. It is, it is, um, it is a, does not benefit us at all. It benefits Miami-Dade, it benefits Broward, it benefits Palm Beach, it benefits Orlando or um, Osceola and Orange and whatever else, it benefits Pinellas. This is not a benefit to us. So, um, uh, and I, I was very much assured by transportation experts and uh, people that deal with this that um, that it, that would preclude us from getting. We wouldn't get funding from for CSX going from USF to downtown. In fact, they said that they were trying to change it to. Uh, between job centers or between residential and job centers as opposed to intercity because of the the lack of access we would have to any of these funds. So I would um, suggest that we remove intercity at very least uh, from this uh, because that is that very much um, kills our opportunities at all. Um, and so I'll, I'll I'll, I will uh, withdraw my amendment and make another amendment that says that we remove intercity from this um, proposal. Motion to uh, amend was withdrawn. A new motion to amend is put forward uh, just to remove the word uh, intercity from our lobbying efforts um, to press forward. Uh, changing, uh, opening up the funding that's in state statute 341. Is there a second? I'll second that. Motion to amend by Commissioner Kemp, second by Commissioner Overman to, uh, to just take this small piece of our legislative agenda and make sure that our heart lobbying uh, efforts are uh, uh, targeted to broadening that statute, but taking out the word intercity, so it will benefit all of us. Um, any discussion to this amendment? Uh, I've got, let's see who's next. Um, Tyler, H Director Hudson. Hey, thanks. Uh, I assume everyone can hear me. So my concern with how specific this, this portion of the presentation is, so I think we're giving the staff a little bit of inconsistent guidance of, on the one hand, if it's our priority to diversify state funding sources, I think that's an admirable goal that we probably all share. But I think we're getting kind of in the weeds here. I mean, Chapter 341 is the Florida Public Transit Act. It is replete with references um, to a rail program. I mean, this is sort of the state framework for, for rail projects. And so I, I don't want us to get to give, get the sense that by changing one definition, in this statute, we accomplish perhaps what we what we want to do. This is a rail statute, and there are some provisions for for other mass transit programs. But if we want to have a new funding source for BRT, it strikes me that you know, the better charge to staff in Holland and Knight would be to come back to us with you know, some more specific ways to to achieve that. I, I'm I'm concerned that just you know doing Control F and find and replace inner city rail service. Um, with the other definition, that 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 alone is is not sufficient. It's a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient one. So, a question that I have to Lorena and staff is, what, it, it, you know, it, how how firm are these priorities? If we pass these, can we come back in a month or two with some better guidance from the team on what what we're trying to accomplish here? Because I, I don't think this specificity accomplishes it. Thank this you, Dr. Hudson. This is Lorena Hardwick with Heart. Um, these, you know, these are not, they're not firm in the sense that these get passed, you know, there's, there's nothing we can do to, to change something. They're firm in the sense that it gives us a guidance and it gives us direction as to how to move forward with our legislative team and with our partners um, locally and um, in the region. So, again, two, these two specific ones were something that as they were being crafted, it was discussed with the Hillsborough MPO, with the Pinellas MPO, with PSTA, and we were just trying to, you know, create a sense of unity in how we're moving forward and making some of these asks. 
Um, so, you know, when we briefed or when we had these uh, initial meetings and, um, you know, specifically with, uh, you know, with, with our commissioners and uh, with the committee, you know, there obviously there was conversation as to, you know, what specifically are we trying to target in these um, particular statutes? So that's why we went ahead for, you know, the board presentation to put the actual statute there just to kind of give it a little bit more um, of a robust, uh, you know, look and to see what exactly we're talking about. So I guess to, again, to the point of your question is, we can move forward with an amendment to say, you know, we we would like to move forward with, of course, finding uh, more creative ways to fund bus buses and to fund transit, um, you know, true transit that with buses like with part, but, you know, also gives us the flexibility that um, we can come back to you. We absolutely can come back to you with Holland and Knight and say, hey, listen, we've looked at 341 or we looked at another statute and we think that we can find some avenues where we can work with a few legislators and say, hey, let's expand, you know, this part of it. Can we work on, you know, again, the, the whole point here is just expansion of transit dollars. Um, it, we are very limited and, you know, money is not going to regenerate um, at the FDOT level. And the budget is not looking great uh, for the next year and two to three years. So, you know, these again are just um, policy, looking at it, having conversations um, at the state level. And we haven't tested the temperature on these yet. We don't know what the reception will be. So absolutely, we can come back and, you know, have further discussion, look at other avenues to do this. But I think um, to your point, what we're trying to accomplish here is just to find different avenues of funding and trying to increase that at the state level. Thank you. Board members, I see several hands up. Would you please um, remove your hand if you do not want to discuss this amendment? We have an amendment on the floor and then we will take up the motion. We're, I'm trying to get to a vote on that. Mr. Schistler to the amendment. Thank you. I just, and you may have clarified this, it's, it's a little difficult to hear staff sometimes. Um, for Ms. Hardwick, what would, what would the impact of removing the, the, the term intercity have upon this, both, both the, the, your plan and the plan moving forward with the legislature? That I, 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 is this Dr. Schistler? Mm-hmm. Yes. I, think I just want to. I was addressing the the appropriate person, Dr. Schisler. I don't have a concrete answer for you on that. Um, that's something that we'd have to go back and um, look through, and you know, make sure that it you know it would be okay with um, some of our other partners as we move forward. Uh, Director Johnson, you're right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to quickly agree with uh, Director Hudson on the specificity of this. Uh, I, I think that uh, if we are going to be too specific going into this with our uh, with our agenda this early, I think it's going to uh, set us up for some problems. Possibly, uh, I think that maybe the the prudent action would be to uh, give Ms. Hardwick, Holland, and Knight the ability to be able to come back to us to be able to uh, amend these. And you know, as we have discussions with uh, our legislative delegation and uh, professional staff up in uh, Tallahassee, uh, that'll give us a little bit more flexibility to be able to uh, allow our staff to be able to do what they need to do to bring something to us quickly. Uh, that's all I've got, thank you. Thank you, and Vice Chair Williams, you're recognized. I agree with the last statement and I, as well as um, Director Hudson. So uh, I will not, um, hold this up I, I will I recommend um I guess I would have to recommend an alternative motion at this point we're just about to take a vote on the amendment it'll pass or fail then we'll move to the uh, main motion on the floor which was to pass the whole legislative agenda thank you and now I do realize blue means I'm raising my hand okay <laughs> okay um, now your hand is raised. Okay, there it's down. Uh, Director uh, Williams, no, McLean, sorry. <laughs> Some of you have uh, names that don't belong to you on your hand, so please bear with me. Cor Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this question is directed at Lorena again. Um, in your discussions with the various transit agencies, did that also include DOT or local DOT reps? Yes. 
DOT reps were present, um, Katina and, and probably some other staff members were present at these meetings. Confirm, and they were agreeable that 341 was an area we would be able to consider? Uh, there were no objections there. Um, they were very supportive of um, all of the uh, areas that we discussed, yes. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I've got three more hands to weed th to wade through this amendment. Commissioner Kemp, briefly, please, to close. Thank you. Uh, I, I did want to just put up 341 again um, on the screen. I thought it was important for people to see that. But I'll just say we are desperately short in Hillsborough County. We're the most underfunded transit system in the nation, not by just a little bit, but by a long shot for any metro area of this size. This um, does not help us at all, and we should not be pushing forward an agenda that does not help us to open it up and then restrict it to intercity fixed guideway is something that hurts us. We need to start making sure that we are getting more resources for Hillsborough County as well. And because we are so different than the other counties, this is not a benefit for us. So um, again, I'll, I'll say the inner city Intercity between cities should be removed so that we can benefit by this as well. Thank you, and thank you for being brief on that. Uh, Director Knight, you're recognized. To and thank you. And I also I agree with uh, D Director Hudson and Johnson, uh, William, and all some very interesting uh, comments. I'll delay as well. If it's for a vote to vote down to get more information and get our attorney involved for more clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Director Knight and um, uh, Director Hudson to the amendment. Yeah, I'm a bit of a novice on the parliamentary procedure here. So I guess I want to see if I can make an amendment to Commissioner Kemp's motion that might reflect the will of at least the folks, some of the folks in the room. Is that something I can do? We have an, or, um, uh, I'm gonna ask um, uh, Ms. Mandel, can we amend an amendment or would you have to amend the main motion? The amendment would allow that. I'm sorry. Amend the amendment if the maker of the motion will allow it. So what you would need, if the maker of the motion, uh, the amendment won't allow the amendment, you vote on the amendment and then there can be another amendment made. Okay. Um, it, uh, Mr. Um, Hudson, what is it that you're trying to do? I'm trying to make less specific this element of the legislative priorities and to say that we would direct staff to pursue modifications to Florida statutes that would provide new funding sources for transportation projects that can exclusively and non-exclusively be operated within the heart service area. Exclusively and not exclusively? I, mean, I think to try to capture a little bit, I, mean, I understand Commissioner Kemp's concern, and it's a, it's a valid one, that th this should not be used as a straw by which other jurisdictions can take funding out of the heart service area. So I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. Some transportation modes by their nature um, stretch beyond a, 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 the heart service area. But I, I think we need to be way less specific in what we're directing staff to do. I think we all agree, and not to be too you know, Pollyanna-ish and, and come up with a suggestion that everyone agrees to and therefore is meaningless. But I, I do think we need to soften the direction here and say that staff and Holland and Knight should look into uh, new funding sources and perhaps a flexibility uh, in existing statutes. But we, we cannot I, we cannot ad adopt this slide as is. It, it, it do, it's, 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 in, it's incomplete. It, it is not a matter of just a definitional change and that all of a sudden is going to create new opportunities for funding. We need to give staff, I think, the discretion to come back to us with perhaps more specific means, but this stated specific mean is not correct. And so uh, you would amend the... I would amend this priority to probably be one sentence long and say, pursue amendments to Florida statutes that promote flexibility and transportation funding. Um, let me see if I can cut to the chase here and ask uh, Commissioner Kemp, 
if um, if that does it for you, and you would uh, withdraw your motion to uh, your to amend um, and agree to this other amendment instead. Well. I, I just have to say I was a little concerned um, with the statement that it would be for Hillsborough exclusively or not, because I think everything that we lobby for and put our energies forward for should be a benefit to Hillsborough County and Hillsborough's um, transit system. So, um, I, you know, I, I would be for removing this. Um, from our legislative priorities, and and if we want to say that anything, because intercity exclusively prohibits us from almost any priority that we could imagine at this time, um, and we desperately need service, as you, uh, as many know, in in our unincorporated area, even in our general area. So uh, you know this uh, this is not something that we should. Um, specifically be supporting uh, because it is it hurts us as as I think director Hudson said it's like a straw that takes our dollars to give to other if, if it was passed as is um so I, I director Hudson I'm not sure um in terms of uh, you know I would say that we would explore others benefits that could exclusively um, that we would be included on benefiting uh, in since it is our policy um, and our lobbyists that we should be able to get a benefit. And this doesn't give us any benefit that I know of. Uh, I'm going to suggest that um, uh, it, 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 we take out the exclusively and put in something inclusive so that it at least in anything this board lobbies for would include Hillsborough County. Um, and I, I wonder if that would get agreement from both of uh, Commissioner Kemp and Commissioner Hudson that we could all agree on to move forward. Commissioner uh, Director Hudson. It would, it would. It's fine. I, th I think really the first sentence of what's on screen, you could just say amend Florida statutes to create new funding allocations for fixed guideway projects, period. Mm -hmm. um, so, Commissioner Kemp, what do you want to do with your amendment? I, I can support that, too. Um, I would exclusively, and I think we've had this discussion, would be against, you know, anything that would be, would, would, um, uh, Restrict it to inner city um, since we don't benefit from that. But that's fine. The first sentence is fine. All right. So you'll withdraw your amendment, Commissioner Kemp, and um, we'll let uh, Director Hudson make uh, this, this other amendment instead. I'm trying to get to our 10 o'clock time certain. So sure, uh, sure. excuse me if I'm trampling a bit on Robert's rules, but I think that's the direction we're heading. Commissioner Kemp withdraws her motion. Commission, uh, Director Hudson, if you would um, restate your amendment. Let's see if we can get a second. I make an amendment to change the slide on screen for the legislative priorities to amend the Florida statutes to create new funding allocations for fixed guideway projects, period. And that is the extent of that element of the legislative priority. Do I have a second? Do I have a second to? Johnson, I'll second. Okay, great. Um, we have an amendment to the motion. Yes, Commissioner Overman. Question. Sorry. Yep, I, and I know we're trying to get through it. So, does it exclude the funding authorization and appropriations request in that? Because there's more following that is to to focus our legislative team for appropriated requests. So, if we strike everything other than that one sentence. Have we agreed that our primary, you know, priority is to find funding authorizations and appropriations, eligibility and participation? Because if that's the case, I do not want to have that off the table. Motion leaves more things on the table and keeps the table large. Okay. All right. yeah. We're expanding the table, but making sure that the table benefits us. So. Uh, Director Knight, your hand is up. I'm good, thank you. Okay, great. So we have an amendment by Director Hudson, second by uh, Director Johnson to uh, amend our legislative um, priority. Um, this is, we're voting on the amendment. 
to amend this before we vote on the main motion to adopt it. So, uh, uh, staff, Ms. Arthur, please take the roll on the amendment. Yes. Director Castor? Yes. Director Hudson? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Kemp? Yes. Director Knight? Yes. Director McLean? Yes. Director Overman? Yes. Director Schisler? Yes. Chair Smith? Yes. Director Fraser? Yes. Director Vieira? Yes. Director Williams? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings us to the main motion to adopt the legislative priorities as amended. Um, that motion was by Commissioner Overman and seconded, I hope, staff of who seconded that motion. Yes, Director Vieira. Great. Yes, that's right. Okay, take a roll call vote on the main motion. Thank you. Director Castor? Yes. Director Hudson? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Kemp? Yes. Director Knight? Yes. Director McLean? Yes. Director Overman? Yes. Director Schisler? Yes. Chair Smith? Yes. Director Fraser? Yes. Director Vieira? Yes. Williams? Yes. The most, the most unanimously. Great. And we are only six minutes late for our time certain. So uh, uh, good work. It uh, did take a, a quite a bit of work to get here. So um, that brings us to our item number 11, uh, interviews with the finalists for our position of heart CEO. Uh, the agenda item starts with a note about voting procedures, but we'll be going over that after the presentation. I just want to provide a very brief little background for the record by way of context for the public to understand where we are in our process. Um, the recruitment process started this summer with applications due on September 14. 163 individuals applied for the positions from 28 states and we had several great applicants our consultant, GovHR, reviewed those applicants and presented eight candidates for the board to consider on October 14. Of those, the board selected four candidates for further consideration. Since then, all the board members have had individual meetings with each of the four candidates. And that means that each of our four candidates have made themselves available for interviews with all 13 of us, and many thanks to all the candidates and all of our board members and our consultant for putting in the time necessary to get us to this point. And thanks to Hart's staff, uh, Ms. Arthur, Ms. Pettit, for making all those meetings happen within two weeks. So we come here today at the final stage of this process with all of us having spent considerable time researching these candidates, reviewing their qualifications, and interviewing them each one-on-one. -on -one. And we are now today ready to conduct our final interviews as a full board and discuss the finalists with each other um, at this point. So is um, uh, Ms. Stevens, uh, do you have uh, our GovHR representative, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I think date, um, and it's been our pleasure to work with you uh, on this process. And I think your first candidate um, is ready. And again, the structure is each candidate will have about 10 to 15 minutes to make a presentation to the board. They were given a question to, uh, to uh, they were all given the same question to outline their uh, their priorities for the first six months and year, and then the board may ask any questions and you have, a, you know, each candidate's been given about a total of 45 minutes for you today. Thank you. And the last note board members after they're allotted time with us, each candidate 
will be leaving the meeting. Some will be rushing off to catch a plane to get home. So please ask any questions you have for each candidate during their interview time. And then that candidate will leave and the next candidate will come in and we'll talk to that one in their time slot. And after we've seen each one of the four, they're all gone. There will be no further opportunity to talk to them. And then we'll move on to our deliberations among ourselves about our preferences for our next CEO. Uh, Director Knight, did you have a question about the process? Your hand is up. No, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so our first candidate, um, Mr. Bernard Jackson, uh, we can welcome him into the room. Getting started. And uh, Mr. Jackson, let me just welcome you. Um, we're very glad you're here. Um, and, and you know the drill that we've set up, 10, 15 minute presentation, and a little bit of follow up questions from the board or any comments or questions you have for us. Um, by now, we know quite a bit about each other. You've met all of us individually. So at this point, um, I see your presentation is queued up and I will just give you the floor to start your presentation. Welcome, Mr. Jackson. Madam Chair, and it's my pleasure and honor to come before the board today. Good morning, uh, members of the board. Good morning, our uh, interim chief. Uh, good morning, chief counsel. Uh, my name is Bernard Jackson. Uh, I'm here to present uh, what I believe will be my 365-day proposed transition plan, which I'm presenting not only to the board, but the entire heart uh, community. Uh, this, board, I, this, this board, I believe, has done a tremendous job in, in uh, selecting the final four candidates, and I certainly am excited about being considered as part of that process. So let me start by reintroducing myself again to you all. I, it was a pleasure having, a, having the uh, time to actually talk to you all individually. I learned a lot about the agency and what, is, what, what are some of your expectations uh, moving forward. And I'm excited about this process. Uh, for me, Bernard Jackson, I've been in uh, public transit over 30 years now. I've enjoyed every uh, single moment of it. As you can see on the screen here, it kind of reflects what my executive level experience has consisted of so far in transit, uh, from not only running uh, bus garage uh, division locations, but also uh, being a part of our rail operations communication center where I oversaw bus and rail operations for the Chicago Transit Authority, and then advancing to where I'm currently now is the senior executive uh, officer for Metro Rail Operations. But the classifications and training that I am most proud of is where I first started and where everything began for me. And that's as a uh, bus operator at the Chicago Transit Authority. I was really excited about being able to have the opportunity to work for such a great agency, to be able to meet such great people, to be able to interact with our communities. And those, those opportunities uh, where I first started out is what's more dear to what I believe uh, is what my career has been all about. So I'm very excited about that. So now I want to get into what I believe my goals will be as I embark on this opportunity for this agency. I've actually uh, uh, highlighted eight, eight particular goals that I think is essential for any CEO that's coming into an organization. Of course, your organization structure is going to be very important to any transition, transition program. But I believe leadership stands at the top. And to be able to have the opportunity not only to uh, meet with the local state, federal stakeholders, but also uh, our, our, our transit advocate communities, our business communities, and any other local and state um, partners that also assist in making sure that we're able to provide service to the community. And that includes the Department of Transportation, the city government agencies, the county government agencies, and having a good working relationship uh, with those various different departments, which make up what I believe is a vibrant uh, transit transit network. Uh, and then my other goal, of course, is the covert the covert recovery task force. And I think the heart 
uh, is effectively responding to the health crisis and, and, and deserves a lot of tremendous amount of credit. Of course, our frontline employees have been doing a, a tremendous job and they deserve a tremendous amount of credit uh, for their efforts and bravery as they navigate through this crisis situation. But being able to get into the agency and wrap my arms around what I believe uh, would ensure that we can continue to provide the safety, the necessary resources, uh, uh, which means the PPE and all the other things that we can do to attract our, our, not only our customers back into the system, but to make sure that our employees are safe as well. And then the other goal, of course, is our fiscal sustainability service op op optimization in the customer experience. How do we heart, we ensure that we are physically responsible to get through this pandemic situation and then embark on some of the uh, opportunities that may exist down the road. All transit agencies across America are dealing with the challenges, our uh, uh, financial challenges of this COVID situation. And being in a position to be able to reimagine on how we want to approach this situation coming out of this pandemic, I think is going to be very essential uh, to how we do that. And then another goal is, our, of course, I just heard some conversation here that took place about the board about what's next down the road for uh, hard in terms of what do we want to reimagine what our system is going to look like in the next five or ten years, having that long-range transportation plan, building new partnerships and capital project opportunities that may exist uh, through our state legislation, through our federal government as well. And then the technology part of it, are we, are we emphasizing our position as we embrace private partnerships, uh, the innovation to deliver customer-facing technology tools and be more uh, accessible to our customers and with real-time data, I think is going to be essential as we look forward to how we want to uh, transition hard down the line. And then safety and security. You hear a lot of lip service about safety and security, but for me, it means a lot. It's personal for me to make sure that our employees are safe, that our customers are safe, that our system is secure, that people can rely on our system. Uh, that's going to be one of the most challenging things for public transit agencies to convince our customers that it's safe to come back into the system to be able to ride our service. So that's, that's something that's going to have to certainly be looked at very carefully. We want to be able to attract not only our, our, our regular riders, which is our choice, which is our, our dependent transit riders, but also how do we attract choice riders into the system? That's by, that's by convincing them that the system is safe, that the convince, convincing them that the system is secure and that they can get to their, their destinations without being uh, any challenges. And then asset management and state of good repair projects. Uh, how do we make sure that our fleet that we're running is secure? How do we make sure that we're maximizing our mileage? How do we make sure that we're cutting down on our mean miles between defects for our trolley cars, for our van service, for our, for our, uh, for our buses? How do we ensure that? That, that we're getting the maximum amount of performance out of our service. And that's due asset management. That's due making sure we have a good state of repair process that's in place. And then my final goal is to make sure that our employee engagement and workforce development, which I believe is our most important uh, human uh, commodity that we have, and that's our frontline employees. How do we continue to embrace them? How do we continue to support them? Uh, our frontline employees is what make up a transit agency and how do we support them from our administrative staff, from our, our, our operations staff that works closely with them every single day through our financial staff. How do we make sure that we provide them the resources they need, especially during these challenging times where their anxiety levels are so extremely high? And then workforce development. How do we bring in opportunities for our employees to show them that there are other opportunities that may exist within the transit community. Transit is a trillion dollar operation. It expands the whole entire globe. How do we introduce our employees to these various different opportunities? A world-class city deserves a world-class transit uh, uh, service that we can make sure that we're maximizing opportunities to reinvest in our own employees, I think is essential to a transit agency. So my first 30 days, and I'm very, I'm very endeavored to complete this on time. I know you guys are, are running a very tight schedule, so uh, I'm watching the clock very carefully. I want to make sure that, uh, that I'm inconsistent with the time allotted for me today. Meeting with the board members, meeting with the interim CEO, meeting with our ATU leadership, I think is extremely important. You want to make sure that you have a working relationship 
uh, with your labor partners, that you guys are having constant communication and dialogue on a regular basis. I call it combined shared interests, where we can sit down and, and come together and have frequent discussions about what matters most to our frontline employees. Uh, then it's certainly working with our elected officials to get an idea of what their what their uh, ideas are about transit and how we can work together and help support those ideas and, and, and move forward. And then certainly the community, the transit advocates, the clergy, uh, there's a strong military presence here. How can we partner with that military, uh, continue to partner with them to per perhaps expand our service levels uh, to those particular areas? And then certainly our regional bus partners that are, are part of the process too. How do we continue to work closely uh, with them. And then as we continue through this process, of course, there's a comprehensive budget review that needs to take place. We were fortunate here at the agency that we did receive some CARES Act, like most transit agencies, but is it going to be enough to offs offset some of the losses that could possibly continue to rise out of this situation that we're dealing with? Uh, you're talking about a reduction in ridership, you're talking about a reduction in the sales tax revenue. Uh, is it going to be enough to get us to the next fiscal cycle? Certainly a couple of things you don't want to hear about in transit, and that's reducing service, that's, that's, that's potential layoffs, that's, that's raising fares. You want to try to stay away from those three parameters as best you possibly can. So it's going to be essential uh, that the incoming CEO sit down with the chief financial officer and make sure that you're going over this line by line to make sure that your revenue streams are in place to continue to provide the service that the customers come to expect. Uh, working with the after peer group group, they started a, uh, a COVID task force that's being led by the CEO at LA Metro, uh, my CEO, Mr. Phil Washington at this time, partnering with the other transit agencies and learning from what they're being exposed to and what they're having to deal with to make sure that they have the resources speaking with one voice to the federal government to let them know that uh, transit agencies, in order for them to continue to survive and strive under these conditions, that we're going to continue to need that help and that support. And then as we continue through that process for the next CEO, how do we improve the customer experience? I think that means that you have to be out there in, 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 out there with the customers. You have to be out there with the community groups. You have to be out there with your employees. You have to be out there with the business community uh, to make sure that you guys are all working together to improve that customer experience. If it's just uh, you increasing lighting at a bus stop location, you're increasing the shelters at a bus, lop, bus stop location, or you're looking to expand your, your, your network. Uh, there was some discussion here briefly about how do we get to rail here in this particular community? I can tell you firsthand, bus is always going to be the backbone of your operations, but rail is the ultimate game changer when you think about becoming a world-class city and being a world-class transit agency. How do you incorporate that into the process? Uh, we've seen it happen time and time in different places uh, across the country. Uh, so making that a reality is going to be essential to well, how we look like down the road in the next five or ten years with our long-range uh, transportation plan. Of course, you got the Super Bowl here, so there's a lot of planning that goes into the process for that, which I'm sure has already started. I've been instrumental in planning full-scale events uh, throughout my career, working with the Departments of Transportation, our law enforcement partners, and fire as such. And then how do we ensure that we have a platform that includes <coughs> equity uh, throughout the process? Uh, we want to we want to be fair. We want to be equitable. We want to make sure that we're we're, we're, we're including equity in all of our decision makers. If that's from, from, from community-oriented development, uh, from customer-oriented development, how do we include that equity framework in all of our decisions to make sure that we're, we're inclusive and not divisive during the process? And so as I continue through that 160-plus days uh, of making sure uh, that the uh, agency understands what my expectations are, what I look forward to doing with the um, agency and how I want to work closely with the community to improve the lives of the, of the people that we serve here. It's going to be very interesting to make sure, again, that safety is at the forefront of everything we do. And it's just not lip service for our employees because they really appreciate when you can actually go out there and be a part of that. And I think that's one of the things that kind of 
you know, separates me from others is that I've actually walked in those shoes. I've actually been there uh, before. And so finally, as I, you know, as I conclude this discussion with you, uh, members of the board, I really appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk to you about what my goals are, are going to be uh, for the agency. Uh, my strategic vision is going to be for the agency. I can tell you guys firsthand that I consider this to be truly an honor. I think, I think the Tampa, the Hillsborough community is on the verge uh, uh, of having an incredible transit uh, agency over the next five to 10 years. I think the board here is very supportive of that, uh, and I look forward to being a part of it. And if selected to participate, uh, and be a part and be the next CEO, I can assure you that uh, my 30 years of experience working at the second and largest transit agency uh, in America, my passion that I have for not only our employees but the communities uh, will be an essential part of my character as I move forward. I'm truly ready to hit the ground running and start establishing these partnerships that I believe would help HART continue with its rich history of providing good transit service. If selected to lead this agency into the next chapter, I can assure you that the resources will be managed effectively, that I will inspire and motivate others to expand their transportation and mobility vision toward the future, setting clear, concise goals of expectations. Uh, there's nothing more important to make sure that you have some consistent goals that you're trying to accomplish uh, in the transit industry and commit to a diversity, uh, commit to a diversity of thought where diversity and, and inclusion, equity is a part of the framework. And working hand in hand with you, first the board, of course, to uh, understand what your direction and what your expectations are, that's as a group and also individually, uh, and certainly working with the employees and the citizens of Tampa in order to make this a great transportation agency. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Thank you, Mr. Jackson, and thank you for keeping it uh, tight. I know we started with you a little bit late, so we're we're going to just have to push everything back a little bit to make sure everybody has the same amount of time. Um, uh, and I see Director Williams, you are recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Jackson, for um, for your presentation, and you spoke to the 30, 60, 90 day. Um, actions that you would take, as well as let me back up and congratulate you from getting coming from 162 applicants to the one of the top four. So uh, it certainly is an honor to have some conversation with you in regards to what you could potentially do for heart. And and so while I'm used to seeing the 30, 60, 90 day plans, and I I, I uh, appreciate your 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 growth up in the organization. One of the things I, I'd like to hear more about is how you measure your success. Uh, when we have goals, they seem to be sometimes not as tangible as we would like them to be. And we really want to make sure that what we do and how you build trust and credibility is through the successful uh, management and measurement of performance. And so could you talk a little bit about how, how you've done that in the past, please? Thank you, uh, Director Williams. That's a great question. And in, in, in the world of transit, you're constantly being evaluated by your, your performance. Uh, so ensuring that you have a, a transparent operations through your performance management network, working with your team, working with your senior leadership team, uh, again, working with your labor partners to ensure that you're providing outstanding trip experience for the customers, to ensure that you have high quality mobility options that exist uh, for the customers. Uh, I've been fortunate throughout my career that I participated in several performance management uh, initiatives. I, in fact, I, I helped start one at Chicago Transit Authority that I'm most proud of, but what we described at the Daily Flash Report, where we would look at everything related to transit on a consistent basis. What happened the day before and what could, have, what could we have done differently or better to improve the customer experience? That's from uh, looking at our, our, our fleet requirements to make sure that we have enough fleet available to provide rollout, looking at our manpower requirements from our day-to-day -day operations to ensure 
that we have enough personnel in order to meet what of our schedule requirements are, looking at how we actually respond to uh, uh, mean miles between defects on a consistent basis. All this rolls up into that ability to evaluate performance management on a consistent basis. I believe in data. I believe that data has a tremendous uh, uh, impact on what we do and how we evaluate that data can actually shape how we perform it on a consistent uh, basis. Being responsive, being accountable, being trustworthy to the community, you touched on that briefly as well, Dec Director Williams. Uh, I believe in transparency. We are stewards over taxpayer money and resources, so we have to make sure as an agency we hold, we hold that high in our decision making. We don't want to ever take that for granted uh, as a transit agency. The challenge for most public transit agencies is, uh, is that oftentimes you're not dealing directly with, with, with monetary, with, with the money. You're just dealing with paper transactions. So how do you make sure you reinforce in your staff that all this is going to eventually translate over into some type of financial impact? The one great thing about transit, unlike in other, public, other public entities, is that you have the ability to actually collect fares. You have the ability to uh, bring in revenue through um, marketing campaigns, through, through sponsorship opportunities that may exist out there. So you can offset some of your, your challenges financially from that standpoint. So I think that's extremely uh, important as well. But ultimately, what I, I, I think what you're getting at is how do you make sure that your team is focused on strategy and strategizing on what you think you need to accomplish? And that's through performance management. That's through it, uh, setting clear targets that you know that you can strive for on a consistent basis, on a, on a daily basis, and you want to make sure that you meet or exceed those targets. And if you're not, why not? And do you need to redefine what those targets may exist considering the situations or circumstances that you may be faced with? Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Director Frazier, your. Thank you, Chair Smith. Um, Mr. Jackson, thank you for being here. I, I appreciate your presentation. Um, you had your top um, eight goals included leadership and employee engagement. And I just kind of want to meld those together and, and dive a little deeper. Um, you're unlike most CEOs coming into a new organization, you're going to have an existing workforce. I mean, particularly here, we've had a lot of leadership changes over the past couple of years, and you're going to be tasked with recruiting into new positions as well and creating a cohesive team that moves in the same direction. How do you plan to go about that, and what will you be looking for as you recruit new employees? Thank you, Director uh, Frazier. That's a, that's a great question. And I think team building is essential. Obviously, um, this agency, as we talked about when I had my one-on-one -on -one interviews with all of you all, um, there has been some challenges, of course, at the leadership role. It's not unexpectedly. It happens at other transit agencies. It happens in corporate America. Uh, it does occur. And I think the next CEO coming in, one of the first things you want to do is you probably need to just put a hug or just want to hug the employees. You want to let them know that you're here to represent them, to lead them, to guide them into the next generation. And what particular, what 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 led us all to this, where we are today, uh, is good for discussion at some juncture. But you, I think you need to focus on what's the next chapter of the agency, uh, and that's going to come with effective leadership from the top, uh, talking directly to your to your employees, talking directly to your staff being open and honest and, and transparent with how you want to see things start to shift uh, down the road, I think is going to be extremely important for the next CEO. Uh, certainly looking at uh, um, the positions that you mentioned that are vacant and thinking about how is there opportunities where we can perhaps uh, combine some re responsibilities given the financial situations that the agency may be dealing with or looking at how we can possibly bring in some people to fill those positions. I like to make, I like to make sure that all of my positions are filled on a consistent basis. I think that's extremely important. You have budgetary positions. You have people that are responsible performing certain tasks. You want to make sure that you're getting the best and the brightest individuals that you can possibly find. I've been very fortunate throughout my career that I've been a part of several different organizations. Uh, whether it's through APTA, whether it's through COMPTA, whether it's through the ENO, where I've developed a tremendous amount of uh, relationships uh, from, from New York all the way to Los Angeles. And those relationships have, have helped propel me to where I am before. But I think there are a tremendous amount 
of individuals right here in this community that are willing and able to step up and handle some of these responsibilities. I just think uh, it's going to take an effective uh, leader. It's going to take effective teamwork. It's going to take uh, reimagining how you want to see transit uh, operating in this area uh, and looking at how we can move things forward down the road. So I, I'm very excited about that. The leadership part that you mentioned is very critical. That's why that's included in my uh, 30, 60, 90 day review. And it has to be a continuous process as you lead the agency. Thank you. Director Frazier, uh, is that it? Does that answer your question? Um, Director Vieira, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's good good to see you again, sir. I, I, I hope you're doing well and, and thank you for uh, going through this process. And again, uh, congratulations on making it to the final four, so to speak, like we talked about before. Um, you know, something that um, we talked about before was the, the obvious challenges that, that HART as an agency will be going through, um, you know, come whether it's, uh, you know, economic challenges, COVID, uh, struggles with the sales tax, et cetera. You know, we're going to need somebody there as the CEO who is going to be a, um, um, a, a public cheerleader, I guess, if you will, and a stable, consistent cheerleader uh, with the public, with other elected officials on a federal level, et cetera, uh, when it comes to the, the challenges that we have. Um, how comfortable uh, would you see yourself in, in, in that position from a, from a public perspective? And let me also add just something that I liked a lot in, in when we uh, – uh, spoke was, uh, you know, you're coming up the ranks, so to speak, um, as, uh, you know, working, uh, as being an ATU member early on, et cetera. Uh, I think that uh, that's certainly something that's important. But how do you see yourself in that regard, sir? Uh, thank you, Director Vieira. That's, that's an outstanding question. And I certainly appreciate the time that you and I had to uh, uh, talk through some of these challenges and issues. Uh, where, where, where some people see challenges, I see opportunities. Uh, that exists. Um, uh, having having go already gone through the experience of not only working with our lo local, county, state representatives at two of the largest two of the largest transit agencies in in, in North America, uh, from certainly having the opportunity to establish positive working relationships, uh, not only at our state level but also at our federal government uh, level. Uh, on so many different on so many different occasions, I think it certainly has shaped what my career is up to this point. Uh, in order for you to have a thriving, successful transit agency, you have to be willing to partner uh, with these various different entities. They make all the difference in the world. There's trillions of dollars in, op in, in, in opportunities that exist in transit. Uh, and in order for you to be in a position where you can actually take advantage and, and be able to uh, maximize your opportunities is through these relationships that you have to form. And it, it requires you to be out there in the community. It, be, it requires you to be the face of the agency. It, pro it provides you to make um, uh, uh, exceptions to what you would normally do or what you would normally expect from, from, from you and your team. Uh, it, 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 it allows you to be able to look forward down the road as you develop your 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 long your short and long range transportation plans I think is is essential to that to those opportunities um, uh, and certainly being able to you know work at the, with the, with closely with the board of directors I think that sets the tone there to hear what your what your plans are for the agency and how can we work together and merge those plans into a reality and make this agency continue to move in the right direction. And then, as you mentioned, Director Vieira, it's, what I cherish most about my career thus far is, yes, I was an ATU. I was, a, I was in the ATU. I was a bus operator. I started there. That's what I'm most proud of because it set the foundation for what my career is today. And I take that wholeheartedly. While I do look at things from a corporate perspective, it's, not, it's never lost on me what those frontline employees have to do and what they actually mean to an agency. So I think that's, that's extremely important. Uh, 
Uh, but being the face of the agency, you have to be selfless. You have to be able to go out there to the community. You have to be, you have to be able to partner with the, with, with the city government agencies. You have to be able to partner with the mayor's office, the Department of Transportation. I've had all those relationships before in my career. I remember early on at, um, during my time at the Chicago Transit Authority, well, we had to meet with the Department of Transportation. We had to meet with the mayor of city, uh, in City Hall and some of the transportation deputies to talk about various different initiatives that were impacting the city. And, and, and the transportation agency, you don't necessarily control everything, but you can, you can influence, you can inspire, you can instigate, you can impact, you can make a difference, you can show that you're part of this, the structure or the fabric of the city and the community. Uh, so you, you, you play an essential role in how all that kind of works together. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the reason why I'm so excited about this opportunity. Uh, it's those relationships that are formulated uh, outside the community, outside the workplace with our state and local and the federal uh, partners, but also with the board of directors working hand in hand with each and every one of you all to make sure that we're living up to what the mission of the transit agency is. Thank you. Uh, Director McLean, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I too want to say uh, congratulations for being here. And it was truly a pleasure talking to you. Actually, we got to talk twice due to te technical difficulties on my side. Um, mine is more of a philosophical question and, and not a long one, but, uh, but thanks to our, our mayors um, and our city leaders, you, you find Tampa and Hillsborough County to be a very active very vibrant uh, and and definitely a growing area of the of the country, if you will, um, and one that I'm proud to be a part of. Um, my question to you, and again, more philosophical, is what role do you see transit and heart playing in this active, vibrant, and definitely growing city? Um, you know, for heart. Thank you, uh, Director McLean. That's a great question, and, and once again, I want to thank you for your your service. Uh, should be applauded and certainly appreciated. Uh, I think you, I think you hit it right there on the on the head. Phil philosophically speaking, transit is the is 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 the economic engine that drives all the other government agencies, so to speak. Uh, I visited Tampa here on several occasions. I haven't been here over the last four to five years, but looking around at some of the developments that have occurred over these last three to four years is, is literally remarkable. Uh, and so you have to make sure that you have, have a philosophy that is, that's aligned with, the, with, your, with your mayor, your local, your local government, with, your, with, your, uh, with the citizens, of course, any citizens advisory committees that may exist, and certainly led by the board of di uh, directors. It's so extremely important. You guys have to be locked in together uh, because if there's opportunities that exist out there through the state uh, or through the federal government or through other sources of uh, revenue income streams, you want to make sure that you're speaking with one voice. Uh, so in order, to, in order to accomplish that, you've got to make sure you have a, a good relationship, uh, especially with your local elected officials, with your transit advisory committees that may exist. Uh, Certainly, the, the, the heart is now you have, this, you have this referendum pending before the Supreme Court, which is going to be extremely important to determine how that outcomes unfold. But I can tell you guys firsthand that I've seen how it has worked in other places. Uh, you take L.A. Metro, for example, that had a $120 billion referendum that was passed by the citizens of uh, L.A. County back in 2016 for that election. Uh, which is going to invest over 400,000 plus jobs into that community over the next 30 to 40 years. Uh, so that's that, and that's working with your elected officials in order to make that happen. No one single person can make that happen. You have to make sure you have a team of people that's speaking with one voice, uh, working toward one common cause and one and one goal. And that's your philosophy of thought on how you want to accomplish that. Uh, again, transit, you don't necessarily control everything, but you can certainly influence some things. You can certainly inspire some things to happen. You can certainly impact some things to happen. Uh, but that comes through that, those relationships and having that philosophy where you see beyond your status situation. You see beyond your status quo, where you start to reimagine opportunities that may exist in terms of public transit and how you can connect the lives and connect communities 
together uh, throughout the whole entire region. And yeah, we may not be uh, the New York City Transit MTA, we might not be WMATA, we might not be SEPTA, we might not be LA County or Chicago Transit, but we can be the best mid-level transit service uh, in the state and in the, in, in the country. Uh, but that comes through those collective efforts and those collective um, relationships that you develop along the way. Thank you, Director Knight, you're recognized. Good afternoon, again, thank you for the interview uh, and a real thoughtful answer to the questions that we shared. It was a great opportunity and thank you for coming down. Um, I wanted to know, and we talked on a lot of things and some of the things you said today, um, just like you told me the other day, uh, but like, uh, the low income uh, patrons, the students, um, the elderly and professional patrons, um, down here we may not have as much ridership professional people, but up north, up in uh, California, Chicago area, uh, what are some of the ways that you feel that you have experienced up there that could uh, come down this way, that you can, you can bring down this way? And then also, too, uh, uh, we have a very, which you probably meet some of them, some of the employees, that is real, you know, doing an excellent job in how you plan on, if you get elected, uh, selected, uh, plan on doing the staff. Would it be a wholesale or would you assess what we have and build from there? Uh, thank you, Director Knight, for that question, and it's, 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 that's an outstanding uh, question. Uh, transit make up, the majority of your riders make up the, uh, dependent, are dependent. They depend on transit. They, they, very few other opportunities that may exist. That's why we're seeing now, as we work our way through this pandemic situation, where you have the essential riders that are out there on the system. And although most transit agencies' ridership has reduced significantly, some is more than some more than 70 to 80 percent. You still see people that are riding the system, and those people actually depend on the system. They need the system. Uh, our low-income communities, they need the system. Um, our elderly that are out there on the system, they need the system. They rely on the system on a consistent basis, and certainly our employees that are out, out there operating the system who are considered our heroes, our essential workers that are out there performing in incredible situations. I can tell you, Director Knight, that I drove the bus for seven years and I've seen just about everything that you can imagine under the sun from, from employees being assaulted, from customers being assaulted. Uh, I, 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 there was an active shooter in the subway during my time at Chicago Transit Authority. Uh, there was a young teenager coming home from school that unfortunately got killed on, on one of our buses. Uh, seen all kinds of things, but I never can imagine being, a, being an operator under these conditions in this pandemic situation. Uh, it's something that you don't have a playbook for. You're learning on the fly from month to month. You're going through this process, and you're trying to do everything you can to ensure that they are safe, that they can do their job, that their anxiety levels are as such that, you, that they know that they have an agency of leadership, leadership in place that they know is going to support them every step along the way. So I think that's extremely important. To the other part of your question, now how do we convince these choice riders? Because the opportunity now exists here, I believe, in Tampa, where you start to see these communities develop, you start to see the Central Business District come up, and there's a lot, a lot of younger people that are moving into these downtown quarter areas that we consider our millenniums that take Uber, that take Lyft, that take public transit, that don't even own a car. How do we convince them to be, you know, to come into uh, our system and, and, and take our system. I think you do that through those opportunities when they present themselves. In, in, in 2017, where we had the first inaugural women march that touched just about every uh, state, city in, in the country. We had 750,000 people that descended on, on downtown Los Angeles. Well, we only move about 400,000 people per day on the weekends. Well, we were able to come together and develop a plan of action where we can actually meet those, meet those ridership needs. And those are the opportunities that exist, the Super Bowl, 
uh, people coming into the central, central business district that doesn't normally take public transit. Those are opportunities that exist where you can showcase your service, where you can convince them that, hey, public transit is not a bad option and they can have those discussions with their families, with, with their friends, and you can leave a lasting impact on them to perhaps convince them one day that public transit could be a viable, diff viable option for them as well. And then you start to look at some of your rural areas where you may not necessarily um, think that you are able to provide service in those areas. How can we look at, at, at coming up with some sort of planning or design or meeting with those communities to see how we can inspire them to come into the system from our local colleges, from our universities, uh, from our community centers. How do we touch that fabric? I think you do that, Director Knight, by in being engaged with the community, being out front there with your, with, with your workers, uh, visiting these different communities, visiting with your, uh, with your frontline employees on a consistent basis to let them know how valuable uh, contributions that they are making to the community. Thank you. And um, if we're going to stay even on schedule uh, being 10 minutes late, we're going to have to be wrapping up soon. I've got two more hands in the queue. Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Um, I also want to thank you for applying to the heart position and very happy that you're here. Um, I don't know if I can hit on it any more than has been said, but um, we will not have uh, the resources, even with the tax, um, won't have the resources to bring a system nearly as robust as they've planned in Los Angeles or have in other big cities. Um, we're going to have a struggle, even with how great an impact uh, the tax could be on our system. And so we will be making choices. And, and I know I talked to you a bit about, can, can you just talk a little bit more about, um, you talked about, uh, um, Director Knight asked about equity. I'm very concerned about that. Um, you mentioned quality transit, rail, that the bus is the backbone of any system. I'm just, I guess, wondering, we're a big county, um, and there will have to be choices made, I think, about frequency and coverage. When you talked about choice riders, you talked about millennials downtown and, and in urban areas um, who could start to use the system more. And then you talked about specific commutes, like, for Super Bowl and everything. I think all of that's important, but I'm just wondering about if you start to prioritize or look at how you, where you put resources, um, because we won't have the resources, I don't think, to do it all, um, and, how, and how you could unfold that a little. Thank you, Director Kemp. Uh, I, I think you, 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 you start internally. First, you look at um, the resources that you have available for you, can you uh, re, re, redistribute some of those resources? The, the first thing you want to do, of course, in transit, in transit, and, and any elected official would tell you this, you don't want to have to reduce service. You don't want to have to reduce staff. You don't want to have to lay off people, especially in this pandemic situation where unemployment rate is so extremely low. And you don't want to raise fares unless those are absolutely last resort items that you even want to consider. Um, I know there has been some, some reimagining of some of the bus routes here at the agency, but how can we take a deeper dive into that conversation to see how we're making sure that we're meeting or exceeding the needs of our new customer base here? People are traveling at different times now. Uh, at, in Los Angeles, we just completed a next-gen bus study that was uh, approved by our board. You're talking 150-plus bus routes that now we're looking at how can we bring those routes where we can meet the travel patterns of the existing community right now. Most people are not traveling. Our core, our core riders that usually travel during the peak periods are starting to shift. You have, you have parents that are, are, are riding the system, for example, that may just be going on errands or running errands. How do we cater our service in order to make those connections? You do that with outreach. You do that with data. You do that with working closely with your staff to ensure that, that, that service levels that you are providing are consistent. And if there are areas where you probably need to uh, make some changes, you want to look at those carefully. If you're impacting uh, just a small number of people, especially if they're in a disadvantaged uh, community 
or if they're part of your dependent ridership, you really want to take a close look at at what sort of conditions that you may be putting that community in. Does this mean that they got to perhaps uh, uh, walk, you know, even further to get to their destination before they can actually board some of our services? Uh, do we look at opportunities like first and last mile where we can reinvest in some of those uh, to make sure that we have a platform for, for, for customers to be able to make those transitions? You work with your closely with your board, you work closely with the Department of Transportation, and you look at all these different opportunities that exist, and you don't try to and you try to make sure you're just not looking from one view or one silo um, opportunity, but expanding your network where it covers a diverse audience where you can make these decisions. Yeah, these are tough decisions that all agencies have to make. And I've been a part of discussions. Um, uh, where you had to figure out how to cut 5% off your budget, where you had to issue warn letters to employees because you, you had to reduce your service levels. I've been a part of those discussions, and you certainly don't want to have to go there. But you look at, every, you look at everything possible within the agency itself to see how you can redirect, redirect opportunities, perhaps in different directions, to be able to make sure you're maintaining the services that, that are needed for the community. We are at this point just um, starting to go over even our our late allotted time. So, Councilman Schisler, keep that in mind as you're recognized. Thank you. I'll be very brief. I just wanted to say welcome to Tampa again, and uh, thank you for the, uh, the 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 frank discussions that we had and uh, the answering the questions that you've done so well today. Um, this type of a process is can be gut-wrenching for an applicant and uh, recognize your, your time and thank you for your, your interest in, in coming to serve here on, on, on Heart CEO. And that's all I had. Thank you. Great, thank you. And, and uh, I see no more hands from board members. Um, Mr. Jackson, um, I will just say thank you very much for taking all this time with us here today and all along in this process. and. And thank you for taking the time to meet with each and every one of us. And especially thank you for taking an interest in helping Heart to be the best that we can be. Um, if seeing no more last burning questions, um, Mr. Jackson, do you have a final comment for us or, or question for us before we move to the next applicant? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Heart community, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be able to come before you and present um, uh, some of my goals uh, that I have for the agency. I'm extremely excited about this opportunity, uh, certainly looking to hear more about it, uh, hopefully. Uh, high quality mobility is the option. Outstanding trip experience for our customers is the option. Having a good internal working relationship with your labor partners uh, with your employees, absolutely important. Making sure that we work together collaboratively as a body uh, to transform the lives and communities is absolutely necessary. And so I'm certainly extremely uh, happy to be a part of this process. Accountability, uh, responsiveness, trustworthy, transparency has been the hallmark of my career and I surely am excited about this opportunity. I want to thank you all for giving me this chance to come before you today and look forward to having more discussions with you down the road. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jackson. And um, that's a virtual applause as we, as we bid you farewell today and, and safe travels home. Um, and we can uh, staff bring the next applicant in. That will be um, Mr. Henry Ikwat Ukwa. We are now uh, running, uh, we'll be running about 15 minutes late on our schedule, so we'll, but we'll try to stick there. Sanitize the microphone, so it will be a moment or two. Sure.
Board members, if you'll take your hands down while we're sanitizing the microphone, um, I will uh, thank you all for um, a really good discussion, really great questions, and uh, looking forward to the rest of our our candidates here. Commissioner Kemp and Commissioner and uh, Councilman Schistler, you can take your hands down. All right, um, please let me know when um, our next candidate is ready and I see Mr. Iquid. Welcome and let me just say, we're all very glad that you're here today. And as you know, we've scheduled you for a 10 to 15 minute presentation, plus a little time for follow up questions from the board. I'm sorry, we're running 15 minutes late but we will give you all the time that you are allotted. Um, by now, you've come to know us, we've come to know you a little bit, and you've met us all individually. So I will just um, turn the floor over to you to start your presentation. With well, good morning, uh, board members and uh, those who are here and those who are attending virtually. Um, and to the audience, uh, members of the heart community, um, I want to tell you I'm really um, honored uh, to be a finalist uh, for the CEO position of the Hillsborough Area Transit Authority. Um, having looked through um, a lot of the discussions uh, surrounding this position, even before I applied, um, I felt this is a great opportunity um, for me. Uh, to contribute to the vitality of this region. Um, my name is uh, Henry Ukutukwa, um, and in the next few slides, I'm going to show you and share with you uh, my short and long-term plans uh, for moving hard forward, uh, my goals for the next six months, 12 months, and two to five-year outlook. Um, This slide shows my overview of my presentation. Um, I'm going to start with leadership because that is where everything starts from. Um, leadership is critical to how an agency moves forward. And from there, I will touch on the, the two major unknowns and most urgent issues that faces this organization. I'm talking about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as well as uh, the legal challenge to the 2018 uh, referendum. Those two will decide how we move forward. As part of my presentation, I'm going to share with you a scenario assessment tool that I have developed uh, to help us position ourselves um, and plan for how we will respond depending on where we are. Um, I will present my goals through the Heart Success 2020 plan, uh, which was committed to by this agency. I'm going to do this through the financial management, customer experience, employee success, community value. And in addition to those four, I'm going to add capital programs, and then diversity, equity, and inclusion, which we are not really addressed in the Heart Success 2020 plan. Leadership, what is leadership? Uh, to me, leadership is making decisions. Uh, everybody at every level at some point has to make decision. 
if you are the doorman, you have to decide, do I let this person in or not? That's leadership at that level. Leadership at the organizational level, at the top of the organization, is what people depend on. Uh, when you sit there by yourself and you deciding what am I going to do in these difficult situations, nobody is going to be there to help you. So the exercise of good judgment in making decisions is what leadership is. Um, transparency, vision, accountability, and the good temperament to deal with any situation you find yourself. I call this leadership by deed. So my major focus as I get on board is to ride the ship, leadership that will help us ride the ship of this agency. Uh, the COVID-19 response and preparedness. Um, my goal is to provide responsive, agile leadership to help us uh, navigate this challenge. Uh, in my first six months uh, on arrival, I will review our current uh, safety plans and practices uh, with regard to employee safety, customer safety, the safety of our facilities and rolling stock, be it with respect to providing personal protective equipment, sanitizing our facilities and running, uh, rolling stock. Um, I will review current um, executive responsibilities for how we respond. And then I will assess the impact of this on our service delivery and on our budget. You know, um, this pandemic is not going to go away anytime soon. So we will plan for a long-term approach on how we will deal with it. Um, in the aftermath, we will also be looking at how we do we revive our ridership. And then, of course, um, our operational reset at the end of all this and how we move forward. Uh, this is the scenario planning assessment um, tool that I told you about. Now, our two major uh, unknowns are the, how the, scenario, how the uh, COVID-19 pandemic works out as well as the challenge uh, to the 2018 referendum. Now, what you see here is um, four scenarios, depending on what happens. Scenario A shows um, CARES Act funding continuing, uh, 2018 referendum being upheld uh, by the courts. That is the best option. That is the best place we want to be. Scenario B shows where the funding options remain, but COVID-19 is impacting our service. We, ha we have a very um, upsurge uh, in COVID-19 uh, cases. Scenario C shows where funding decreases, but COVID-19 is improving. And scenario D is where uh, basically the worst case, the worst case of everything. So how do we position ourselves in each of these boxes as we move forward? I will work with you uh, to develop plans in my first 12 months uh, to keep us together and make plans for how we move forward. Now I will go into the provisions and commitment of the HART 2020 success plan beginning with financial management. My goal here is to establish a culture of stewardship, financial stewardship. My first six months here, I'm going to work with the CFO and others on getting to know the critical issues, financial issues that face this agency. I will check on our revenues, our grants, our reserves, our debts, as well as department budgets, labor contract provisions, operational outlays, and our capital expenditures. In the near term, I will also develop implementation plans that will help us strategize uh, for our investments and our debt servicing. I will develop partnerships that will engage legislators um, and other officials to position hard programs uh, for federal grant pursuit. Now, 
I'll work with my team also um, to fund and sustain a meaningful operating reserve that will be healthy uh, for, the, uh, for the operation of um, our services going forward. Uh, the next item will be the customer experience. Um, no organization will move forward if the customer experience is bad. They say treat your customer as the owner of what you provide. Now, this was very well expressed in the HUD 2020 success uh, analysis. My first six months here, I'm going to review and conduct an assessment of our strength, our weaknesses, our opportunities, and our threats. I will look at how we provide our services. I will initiate service quality improvements, uh, realistic service schedules, um, rolling stock reliability and availability. <coughs> I will look at how we train our employees, uh, be it in terms of um, our frontline employees and our backroom employees as well. How do we use technology uh, to enhance our, um, how do we use technology to enhance uh, the quality of service that we provide? And then I will assess, expand, and incorporate safety and security proposals into what we do. A lot of times you hear several cases of employees, operators uh, getting into confrontation with, um, uh, with customers. I believe this happens because uh, the employees have not been properly trained. Or if they have been trained, they have not been retrained. So I'm looking at ways to make sure that the training we give our employees are front and center as we move forward. I will institute a rigorous asset management plan uh, by looking at how we move our state of good repair program and maintenance uh, in our maintenance and operations uh, facilities. And lastly, uh, we will embrace the future. Uh, new, technology, new technologies are there that we will have to tap into. You know, electric vehicles, autonomous and connected vehicles, how do we bring these together? Employee success. My arrival here, I will look to meet the men and women uh, who work at heart and put our services out there every day. Um, I will look to become a part of them. Um, I will lead from the floor, not from the office. I will hold introductory town hall meetings and um, listen to all the employees identifying the issues uh, that they deal with. I will look to create a culture of teamwork and accountability with clear chain of communication, unambiguous expectation. Um, this will help me to create an opportunity of training and development uh, for each of our, uh, of our team members. Succession planning, um, how do people move forward from where they are. I came, from, I came through the ranks myself, uh, starting out uh, as a planner uh, in private practice and then moving over to the, uh, uh, to the public sector side. I gradually worked my way up because people helped me up. Those were mentors who took interest in my progress. So I will look to institu institute mentorship program um, in heart that will help people to move forward. I will assess heart's priorities in relation to the agency's mission. Uh, what is our organizational structure? Uh, what do our procedures look like? Um, what is our, our talent pool? Based on this, I will look to see if there is a need uh, for, if there is a gap, talent gap that we will need to fill. And then we'll look at uh, restructuring or right-sizing the organization. Um, I will tell you that whatever decision we made with regard to that will be communicated 
very respectfully uh, to everybody. And any opportunity we get to bring people on board, um, we will look to get the best. I am a member of the APTA, American Public Transportation Association, and through that process, I have come to know a lot of talents from coast to coast and from border to border. Uh, these talents are available. Some of them are willing to relocate uh, to, to, to Tampa. And I don't know about you, Tampa is, a ve is not a very difficult place to sell uh, somewhere that you will need to move your family to. And um, I will work to get the top talent in the industry to come down here. And then um, if there is need for us to um, do right sizing, um, we will do so uh, in the first six months uh, to 12 months. Community value. Community value is really how you get your legitimacy. Uh, if the community doesn't buy into the service you provide, um, you will not be successful. As the leader of this organization, I am going to reach out to everybody, all our stakeholders, and work very collaboratively with everybody. Um, I will go to community meetings, I will go to churches, I'll go to mosques, I'll go to temples, I'll go to synagogues. I will meet people on their own turf to make sure that I understand what the issues are. And then I will work with the board of directors, um, elected officials, other government agencies on how we can partner uh, to make progress on heart priorities. Now, the impact of heart on the economy, the local economy, as well as the regional economy, cannot be understated. You know, millions of dollars are spent. Even our employees that live in our, in our communities here, um, they have major impact on everything that the community does. Capital programs. If the success, um, if the 2018 referendum is successful at the Supreme Court, we will be flush with money, with resources, at the level that we've never been before. Do we have the vision? Do we have the tenacity? Do we have the partnerships to move these programs forward? I will incorporate life cycle cost decisions into how we move our projects forward. I will look into our state of, um, I will look at um, innovative models uh, to reduce project cost so that what we build will have an impactful return, uh, an impactful re uh, return on investment uh, for our community and for the and, uh, and for our program as well. I will engage the congressional delegation and other elected officials uh, so that we can position hard programs when we pursue federal funding. And as I end this, I will talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, this is not some buzzword for me. Uh, as somebody who is a minority myself, and I have benefited from some of these programs, this is going to be front and center of everything we do. Um, nobody in this agency is going to feel tolerated. I deliberately did not use the word tolerance because you don't need to feel tolerated. Uh, you will be welcomed because our strength is in our diversity. I'm going to strengthen and foster an environment of inclusion and respect to make sure that um, Everybody who walks through our door or does business with us understand that this is how seriously we take this. And then I'll formalize equity review and analysis in every agency undertaking to make sure that we look at how we do business with a very clear intent of pursuing diversity and equity. Now as I end, um, I believe you have a very clear idea of my goals um, and long-term plans for this agency. 
But I want to speak a little about myself and what I bring to this job. For 20 years, I have worked to position myself uh, to lead an organization of this size, of this complexity. I have, I have had experience with large organization, MARA. I have had experience with small organization, Birmingham Transit. I have had experience working in the consulting. And then the project that pretty much defined my career is the Atlanta Beltline, which is one of the most important, one of the most impactful uh, project uh, in the country. The vision to think big is what I bring to this. The ability to get things done is what I bring to this. The ability to attract the kind of talent that will work with me uh, to position hard in a way that we will take this agency to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, I am a very visionary, innovative, and strategic thinker. I'm thinking five steps ahead, even as we struggling with what we're doing here. Um, I work on consensus. Uh, you cannot force anybody to agree with you. But in those areas where you have agreement, uh, you need to make progress. You cannot wait until everything is agreed to before you make progress. And that was how we were able to move the Beltline forward. Um, I'm a stable, very well-rounded individual, um, a technology advocate. I swear by technology. I believe it is one of those things that we can use uh, to increase our customer's experience as well as advance our services. Uh, the ability to thrive in a very complex political environment uh, is what I also bring here. I, as I end this, um, I want to thank the board, uh, the heart community. Uh, I believe this is the time to look for a leader who is well-rounded, uh, well-qualified, uh, so to speak, um, to take what is really a a well-run organization, because um, one of the things I did uh, before I applied was to go to your national transit database and look at what kind of organization HART is. And I realized that there are a lot of good people who work here. All that they really need is the leadership to come in and work with them uh, to move this agency forward. And I will stop here and take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Ikwad Ukwa. And um, we've gone a little bit over in the presentation time, so uh, we're going to have to tighten it up in the question and answer time. Um, Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. I think my um, I think my hand was up from before, but I'll just as long as I'm here, I'll say I was. Thank you so much for applying. I was really just so uh, impressed by your presentation. How um, I, I guess the um, uh, precision of it and um, recognizing um, the, the detail and going forward with a plan like that, I was very, very impressed. I have to tell you that the words that from the beginning that uh, really moved me were, <laughs> culture of financial stewardship because i feel very much like um and this is not uh um on our financing people that i'm i'm saying this but um not a recognition about the costs for the certain investments we make even when we're desperately underfunded um it seems like sometimes we uh you know put out there building um the Taj Mahal rather than a simple um, station or place or a simple service. Um, so I guess, I mean, I just think it's a pretty um, amazing the things that you outlined, um, the uh, courageous consensus builder. I really like that. Yes, there always will be disagreement and that's fine. You move to where you can and you move on what you can agree on, I think. And so I think those were really um, uh, great points. Um, I guess I, you know, I, I, I really like what um, you have here organizationally too, um, in terms of looking at the organizational structure. So I, 
maybe I could ask about that um, yeah, because you talked about, I liked it that you put out a plan there for an organizational structure and you looked at the um, talent pool that Hart has and you um, thought about possibilities otherwise. Um, one thing, I know you said you were gonna be very clear within the organization about that and that's great. Um, how do you envision when you go for this restructuring, I think a lot of board members were taken quite by surprise um, when uh, the last time a restructuring was done without any uh, prior information or discussion with board members. Um, so how do you um, look at bringing the board along with that? I'm just curiously. Um, something of that nature shouldn't happen without the board being apprised of it and the board being a part of it, really. Um, organizational restructuring is, is basically what determines how the organization runs. And if the board that leads the organization, organization is unaware of that, I believe that is a mistake. Um, going forward, the, I am not here to change things um, like I told you. Uh, there are good people who work here. I'm going to work with the team that we have. But you have a lot of open seats, as it is. You have a lot of open seats. Um, and these will need to be filled, um, be it from within or we bring people from outside. Uh, everybody will have a, an opportunity to, a, to be a part of this um, from all over the country or even within this community. Um, I believe there are people here who will see this as an opportunity to, uh, to also work for hard, you know. So whatever this and however this uh, organizational restructuring takes place, if at all, because I'm not saying that I'm going to do it, I'm going to analyze it, and then a decision will be made if it is necessary, you know. Um, but uh, trust me, the board will be a part of that decision. It's not something that uh, will just be um, foisted, uh, so to speak, on the board. Thank you. Um, does that answer your question, Commissioner Kemp? Yes, it does. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Director Williams, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Igwe Tukwa, right? Igwe Tukwa, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, your presentation. I I'm gonna use your words. You mentioned you are a planner. Um, you, you started out with the plan. You're a strategic thinker and visionary. And, Quite frankly, your presentation represents that and shows how methodical you are and, and how you uh, put your put your standards together in a very objective type of manner. Um, you also mentioned agile leadership, and uh, the that may be a term that may be unfamiliar to some of the uh, employees at heart because you're actually looking at uh, processes and you're looking at uh, the ability to implement or either you fail fast. And so sometimes failure is not what we, we, what we want to happen, but it's necessary based on the agile le leadership practice. And so in doing that, in combining that question with the second one, I understand your preparation, your planning, your vision and so forth. I'm just not clear on how you, uh, you relate to others and how you make those things happen in bringing change in uh, stability to the to the uh, agency. I, I, I'm not getting that feel. So if you could help me understand your maybe your style or how you uh, lead people or your interpersonal relationships, and then as you combine some of these great ideas and tested and proven processes and practices that are in the, in the market today. Thank uh, you. Th thank you. Um, my agile leadership actually comes into use in response uh, to the COVID-19 environment. I'm sorry, I can barely hear you if you don't mind. Um, I said my okay. agile leadership uh, comes into use in the context of the COVID-19 response because the COVID-19 environment is an ever-changing one. Uh, there is nothing constant there. You have to be responsive, agile, and flexible. 
uh, to move that forward. You know. Now, in with regard to relations uh, to staff or to people who work with me, uh, I'm a collaborative leader. I, I lead by consensus. Um, I believe that everybody has to have a say and have their opinion uh, before decisions are made. That will create an environment where even if you don't get everything you want, uh, you will get some of the things you want. Uh, none of us will ever get everything we want. So I will offer people the opportunity uh, to express their, their needs and have their opinion recognized uh, in any decision that I made. Is, does that do for you, um, Vice Chair Williams? Yes, thank you. Um, Councilman Schisler, you're recognized. Be brief. I just wanted to uh, say thank you. Welcome to Tampa again. Thank you. And uh, uh, I appreciate the, the time and effort in answering my questions when we spoke a couple of weeks ago. And uh, again, for coming here today and answering the additional questions. Thank you very much, and we look forward to uh, uh, what happens next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if uh, the board members will remove their hands when they're done with their questions, um, I have um, something I'd like to ask you about, um, Mr. Ikwa Ukwa, is I was very impressed in our interview um, with your um, experience and knowledge and perspective and enthusiasm for transit-oriented development and what that really means on the ground and what that really means um, in our community with our transit agency and how that interfaces and comes together with affordable housing and how our transit agency might be um, uh, able to plug in and participate in our local um, uh, visions and and efforts towards uh, transit oriented development and affordable housing. Um, the Atlanta Beltline, which is where I currently work, um, was a vision that came out of a student thesis and um, basically advanced uh, to what is now uh, one of interrupt for just a minute um we've lost the audio there and while we're um fixing technical issues let me say that i think commissioner kemp's hand is not working she doesn't seem to be able to pull that down so we'll just wait on uh having a can you hear me now yes thank you Okay, um, the Beltline has become a very transformational project, but with it came the challenge of gentrification. And this is real. Um, suddenly people who have lived in communities for decades um, have their property values triple. And therefore are challenged to continue living where they are. Now, the Beltline itself was funded on tax increment, meaning uh, back in 2005, uh, the city, the county, and the school district, which are the uh, local government authorities that have taxing authority in the area, agreed to forego, well, agreed to maintain their tax receipts on the 2005 level. So everything after that, every increment over that 2005 level went directly uh, to funding the Beltline. So that is how that works. So uh, that money is now used to implement the, the Beltline infrastructure. So this is something that if your laws 
agree and if the political will exists uh, can be leveraged um, depending on what kind of, you'll have to define the area first and what kind of um, uh, investments or uh, infrastructure or uh, commercial activities will be affected by the single family housing in the Bapine district was excluded. So it's usually, it's mostly commercial housing and multifamily housing so that it's, its impact is on the business people and this is something that they wanted. So uh, it helped that uh, the single family homes were exempted from that. So it's an opportunity for us to work together to see other ways of raising money uh, uh, to pursue infrastructure, um, be it transit or any other things that we can do. Thank you. And if I could just follow up with um, the experience you had working with the uh, 25 neighborhood planning units in Atlanta on land use issues uh, with transit oriented development. Um, can you can you speak a little bit more about uh, how uh, that might inform your um, work here with heart to as we work to uh, encourage more transit oriented development and discourage sprawl in our community and make make transit work effectively and efficiently um, by by helping to um, direct growth in ways that would work together with transit. Um, Atlanta has a a process where they anything that has to do with uh, development and zoning uh, goes through what they call uh, neighborhood planning units, NPUs. There are 25 NPUs in the city. So especially if you're looking for variances uh, from zoning regulations, um, you will have to go through the neighborhood planning units to show them what your plans are. And those neighborhood planning units actually vote uh, whether to approve or not approve your development before you now take it to the uh, to the Department of uh, City Planning where your application will be reviewed, you know. So walking through those neighborhoods that way, uh, you're able to make sure that you're not putting uh, projects where the people don't want, you know. And it also gives grassroots legitimacy to what the planning department uh, is doing. You know, um, one thing I wanted to touch on is affordable housing as it relates to the Beltline. Um, the gentrification issue that I spoke about um, is very impactful. Uh, and affordable housing has become uh, one of the major planks of the Beltline uh, as an agency. Um, everything we do is focused now on making sure that um, we maintain affordable housing in our planning unit. We required by statute, the state, um, I mean, um, the city statute that established the Beltline um, to at least produce 5,600 affordable housing units uh, within the Beltline uh, planning area. Uh, those 5,600, uh, we still, we're not there yet, we're still working towards it, you know. Um, we, our board adopted a policy where every budget, every budget surplus, I think about 75% of our budget surplus will go directly to our affordable housing trust fund. And through that way, we've been able to really raise some money to incentivize development uh, that will help us meet that 5,600 affordable housing target. Sounds like a dream come true to me. Um, uh, Director McLean, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Henry, good morning and, and welcome. It's a pleasure to see you again, too. And hopefully you don't mind me calling you Henry. Okay. So, um, during our, we had a great conversation, and I appreciate that, too. During our conversation, I, I asked a question, and I just want to kind of expand on that just a little bit. And it, and it had to deal with um, what some folks kind of 
commonly referred to as our choice riders, as you know, uh, our ridership, as you er mentioned earlier in your, in your uh, opening briefing there, um, our ridership is bound. How do we reach those people that have other options for transit? Um, how do we reach out to those that you're aware? Um, Midtown is growing, um, West Shore Carter is growing, and, and we have great growth in, in Tampa and Hillsborough County. So how do we reach those other folks out there that do have options for transit using some of your innovation? Um, in our business, um, we have two kinds of ridership. Uh, those who depend on us and are the core of our service, uh, they don't have another choice. They depend on what we provide as the means by which they accomplish their livelihood. Um, we, as an agency, must remain faithful uh, to that group of people. Uh, we cannot do anything that will threaten that. And as CEO here, I am going to make sure uh, that we do that. If you don't mind me digressing a little, I, I had an experience when I was in Birmingham where I was asked to cut back service, you know. Unfortunately, uh, there was a part of the community where there has been a lot of migration away, uh, but you still had about, I believe, four people who still used our service, depended on our service uh, to go to work and come back from work. But we had a bus route that was pretty much empty, you know, it, because a lot of people have moved away from the neighborhood. So the plan was to take away that route. But you have four people, you know. We are in the people business, and this is all about people, but sometimes it gets to the point of where it is about this person. It's not just about people anymore. It's about this person. So that was how specific it had become at that point. Um, I was able to go out there and talk to everybody there, find out who actually used the service, and we found out that these four people uh, based on their schedule, we can provide service in the morning, two runs that will get them in, get them out, and then two runs in the afternoon that will bring them back. So basically that's what we did. We cut out the mid, middle part of the, of the route and took those people in and out, you know, uh, and that took care of that. The other part of our ridership are the choice riders. Uh, these people have options. Um, they use transit because um, it helps them save money or um, it just helps them. Um, con some of them have conscience, social conscience, that they shouldn't be contributing uh, to their carbon footprint. So those are the kind of people, though, who will make your transit grow. Those are the people who will make your transit grow. And what attracts them is their experience, the experiential part of their trip. So you have to make your trip and the services you provide very comfortable, very timely, because usually those things, um, those kind of people, they are very time conscious. You know, uh, you have to make it very timely. And then you have to also make it uh, frequent. Frequency is another thing that helps choice riders um, get on the service. So a combination of those, frequency, comfort, and um, timeliness uh, is important uh, for choice riders. Now, one of the things that have helped us is that the millennials who take their phone and are looking and don't want to drive, that's another group of people that we can you know, begin to focus on as riders. Uh, they don't want to drive. It's become a part of their culture. You know? So we can encourage that uh, by making services available to them, finding out from them. Normally, they're young. Uh, you don't really reach them through our traditional methods, so you'll have to find other ways to reach them and find out what they want in the services that we provide. So we will do our best to make sure that we reach all these people um, to help them uh, continue to use our service, because that is the only way we can actually grow our service. McLean? Thank you, Madam Chair. 
All right, we have one minute left in our time, but uh, Mr. Ikwaruqua, I will I will give you three minutes to um, wrap up with a closing statement or any questions you have for us. Anything you'd like to say before we move on to our next um, applicant? Well, um, Madam Chair, um, the board, uh, the heart community, um, it's been a pleasure and an honor. Uh, to be here. Uh, I believe this is a great opportunity uh, for HART to get to the next level and leadership, a visionary leadership, a transparent leadership that will have the temperament to know when to push, when to pull, and when to stand still is critical. Throughout my 20 years of service, I have exhibited at multiple areas where I showed leadership that moved things. So when I arrived in Birmingham, they haven't had a labor agreement in years. I worked with the executive director then uh, to make sure that we have a labor agreement with the union. Um, so most of our jurisdictions, we are up in arms. I worked with them to bring them back into the fold. So I have the opportunity here to come back here, I mean, uh, to come here and do those things that will help us take heart to the next level. I will hope um, I will get that opportunity with you and I look forward to working with you if taken, if selected. Very much. And um, on behalf of the board, I, I wanna thank you for taking this time with us here today and, and for taking time off with us all along the process, meeting with each of, of us and for uh, taking such an interest in helping Hart to be the best we can be. Uh, it's clear you've done your homework on us. Um, you can uh, count on us having done our research on you and um, we wish you uh, safe travels on your way back. And that will close uh, this candidate um, presentation. Thank you. Um, so, um, it, staff, if you can uh, disinfect and, and make the transition to the next candidate as quickly as possible. Um, Director McLean, I see your hand still up, and I know that Commissioner Kemp's hand stopped working sometime. There we go. Um, Commissioner Kemp, this might be an opportunity for you to um, log out and log in really quickly while they um, have this transition. Yep. Okay. And we will just um, uh, wait a moment for the next um, candidate. Thanks to everyone for your thoughtful questions. Uh, thanks to staff for all your help with our first hybrid meeting. Um, I think we're doing really well. <laughs>
Great. I see Mr. Price queuing up here, and while his presentation is is queuing up, I'll just point out that we are now just about 20 minutes late. So if we start here at 11:50, we will um, start the next presentation at 12:35, so that we don't shortchange any of our applicants. Um, Mr. Price. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you again. Welcome. We're very glad you're here. Um, and as you know, we've scheduled you for a 10 to 15 minute presentation, plus a little time for follow up questions from the board and any other uh, comments you might have for us. Um, we've uh, we've met all met you. You've met all of us um, and, and talked a little bit of, uh, to each other before we've gotten here. So at this point, I will just turn the floor over to you to start your presentation and welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the board chair. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you to the Hart community as well as Hart staff that are listening today. Uh, my name is Jim Price and I'm gonna share with you my plan for the upcoming year should I be selected as Hart CEO. You will note that I didn't put times or dates or when certain things are going to be done because the goals and priorities I have will work to reinforce each other as we execute them. And so um, I'm gonna to try to bring the whole package uh, together. Uh, my first immediate priority will be to ensure that COVID-19 protocols are in place and are being followed. Um, I want to review the COVID-19 uh, policies and procedures but it's not enough to have good procedures in place. How are they actually being uh, executed in, in the field? Uh, so I wanna take a look at the actual adherence. Are our operators, mechanics, and employees doing as they're supposed to be doing according to the policies and procedures? And how is the public and customers at large uh, responding to those public, uh, for those protocols? Because if either doesn't follow the protocols, um, you, it has a tendency to degrade the, the safety of our system. And so we may have to do some training, uh, some outreach to, uh, to uh, make sure that we're in compliance. Uh, having these uh, policies and procedures being dutifully executed is very, very important because one of the things that we're going to have to do as an agency, we need to be able to prove to the public, our customers, that we provide a safe environment in our vehicles and in our facilities. Um, the second immediate priority is a goal to determine uh, Hart's financial stability and to verify the appropriate use of CARES funding. CARES funding came at uh, uh, the perfect time uh, when we were losing revenue due to lost ridership uh, and we had increased expenses uh, to take precautions to harden our facilities and equipment. You know, I think one of the first things that I want to do is make sure that I have a full uh, understanding of funding sources, of revenues and expenses, uh, determine the, st uh, the sustainability of Hart's current financial condition. And I'm not just talking about an immediate um, condition, but how is um, Hart's financial stability going forward? I will I sit down and take a real good look at this current year's budget and make it adjustments for short-term and long-term stability, um, and then take a look at CARES fund funding, find out where it's being spent. Uh, uh, I believe uh, CARES funding uh, is primarily to use to, uh, uh, to make up lost revenue due to uh, lost ridership and to cover those additional expenses that we've incurred making sure that our facilities and our vehicles are, are safe. We don't want to squander the CARES money because we don't know um, when or if we will ever get more. Uh, and from everything that I've read and everything that I've seen, until there's a vaccine, um, uh, COVID is gonna linger in our society for an indefinite period of time. Um, one key to financial recovery is ridership. Uh, we need, we or would be a priority to try to recover as much lost ridership as we possibly can. 
there are typically three ways to uh, increase ridership. One is to provide service in places you don't go currently. Another is to increase frequency. And a third is to market your services. Uh, the first two ways um, are not easy to implement. They're certainly not quick. Uh, there are Title VI studies that need to be done uh, if you're going to either increase service or decrease service or increase or decrease frequencies to look for those impacts. Um, the marketing heart services is the quickest way to affect positive change in ridership. But before you do that, um, you, you have to make sure that your facilities are safe, your facilities are secure, uh, and your, uh, your rolling stock is as well. Um, we need, and then once you're satisfied that you, you've got good policies and procedures in place, that your um, facilities are indeed safe and secure, um, then you market them and say, but in order to market something successfully, uh, the things that you're saying need to be absolutely true. Um, um, perhaps one of the most uh, significant priorities is the health of a uh, heart's organization. Um, I would evaluate, like the, the other candidates, I would evaluate the organizational structure uh, to make sure that it meets the current and future needs of heart uh, and the challenges that it's going to face. Uh, I certainly don't go into this uh, trying to make wholesale changes. Um, I take a middle, uh, minimalist approach to organizational change. I, I would be new to this organization and it would be arrogant of me to impose my structure on an organization that's got its own culture. So I would respect it. Uh, I would approach this in taking um, minimal changes to bring the organization in the direction that I feel that it would need to go. If I find that in order for Hart to succeed, I have to be, take a little bit bigger changes, I will, but I would never do that uh, in a vacuum. My, the employees, the organization internally, and the board would know about the changes well before they were actually impl implemented. The sex f second phase of that is staffing and staff. Do we have the right mix of personnel? Do we have the right skill sets? Do we have the right jobs in order to meet the current and future challenges? And do we have uh, existing staff in those positions for heart to succeed for short term and long term? Um, I would enter into this phase with the idea every, everybody that's in their job, they're in a job for a reason, right? And I want them to succeed. I want them to be happy. And I will work with them to try to make sure that they are successful. Uh, the positions that are vacant, uh, I would look for existing talent. I, I, is the organization, does, does it have the talent in the organization? If it's determined that we don't have the talent in the organization, then um, we would cast the widest possible net that society could provide so that we can, we can attract uh, the best possible talent. Um, but it's not good enough to have really good talent um, if you don't utilize that talent in a positive and effective way. You need, to, you need to be inclusive. Every single employee, in order to get the full value, they need to feel important. They need to feel like they're contributing. They need to feel like they're part of a team. And where organizations often fail, they, get, they hire people, they put them in positions, and then they sit them over in a corner and they begin to ask themselves, why am I here? And we, we would certainly want to avoid that. One of the things that uh, I bring into every organization I've been, we don't hire uh, amateur bus operators. We don't hire amateur mechanics. We don't hire amateur secretaries. We don't hire uh, amateur customer service agents. We hire professionals. 
and we have a ex professional expectation of all of our people, but along with that, we treat every single employee as though they are a professional. We have professional expert, uh, expectations for them. And finally, and this is uh, central to my management style, is you respect everyone all the time. Our bus operators who deal with the public, they respect their customers. Their customers are not always right. They're not always friendly. They're not always easy to deal with. That, we understand that, but you will treat them with respect. And the supervisors in transportation, we are our operators, not all of our operators are ideal. Most of them are, but some of them are not. Some of them have life challenges. Um, I tell the supervisors, in front of the operators, um, they may not always be right, but you will always treat um, our operators with respect. And that works up the entire chain of command. Respect is central to any healthy organization. Respect, inclusiveness of all our personnel. Everybody's got an oar. Everybody's pulling in the same direction. So. Outreach. Um, Heart won't thrive without enthusiastic support of the public. We have to foster relationships, partnerships with communities, with uh, their leadership and other government entities. Uh, we cannot do the, what needs to be done. The work of the people can't be done without these vital partnerships and without the enthusiastic support of our neighborhoods, our communities, our customers, and our employees. Um, some of the things that I would do, I, communications will be perhaps one of my biggest um, priorities in the first year. I, I would start with one-on-one -on -one conversations with my senior staff. They have their finger on the pulse of the organization, of what the challenges to the community are, and I will listen. I will want to know what they think. Um, I will conduct periodic uh, town hall meetings with operators and with mechanics, the frontline personnel. Um, I, I shared with this with many of you in our conversations. Uh, I, I do this quarterly with my operators and mechanics and other employees. and. When I first started years ago, the, uh, those meetings were not always pleasant. There was a lot of frustration. There was a lot of anger. Um, and over time, uh, they, they come to understand that I listen, I act. When I tell them I'm going to do something, I do it. And I can tell you today that those meetings are, are far from those first meetings. They're, they're actually quite friendly. Uh, I still learn a lot. Uh, in those meetings from my operators and from my mechanics. And so conversations with uh, all our staff is vital, and you can't do it one time and think the job's done. Uh, then I, I would meet with our union leadership, uh, talk to them, find out what their concerns, their needs, their wants. Uh, I, I'll share with them. We, we may, not, may not always agree, but I will state my case. I'll explain why I'm doing it, and I will respect your position. I understand what you're doing, and I respect what you're doing, but I have, I have responsibilities that I have to uh, op execute as well, and I will always try to be fair. I will always try to be honest. Um, th that's the internal customer. The, the external customer is every bit as va valuable. Um, I need to go out and talk to every community, every neighborhood, every school, every uh, trip generating source, uh, every uh, destination source, and talk to all the people who have a vested interest in the success of transportation in their community. Uh, I won't have all their answers, especially at the beginning. I won't pretend I do. But I'll go there and I'll listen, I'll take notes, and um, I will come back. And I will have worked on the things that I heard. 
I will tell them what I was able to do. I will tell them what I wasn't able to do. I'll tell them why. And I, I may ask them for help. Um, but the, the idea is I want to be approachable. I, 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 I want, I'm vulnerable. You know, I need them to help me, to be, help heart become a, a success. I'll reach out to community leaders uh, and ask for guidance, ask for direction. What, what do you think is important? How can I help your community? How can I help your neighborhood? And from all this, I'll gather information and compile it and pr prioritize it. And then I'll have a plan that is approaching maturity. All right, this is the time I would say, all right, I would come back to you and say, here are my priorities. This is what I've heard is important. This is what I think we need to do. And I will get your direction, your guidance, uh, and your blessing, hopefully, to, to execute a more detailed plan. And that plan for success, um, we need to success. Uh, we, we need a success in order to build confidence in our, from our employees, from our customers, Oh, that wasn't me. Sorry. Uh, we, we need to inspire confidence. And, and one way that I've found that we've been able to inspire confidence in our, in our employees and in our customers and in their communities is to go out and say, all right, um, we are go we've got X, Y, and Z, and we're going to execute X, Y, and Z. All right? This is why we're doing X, Y, and Z. You know, this is what we think the benefits are going to be. Right? And then do it. All right? And then... Go back and so we did it. What do you think? Did, did it do everything that we wanted it to do? All right. Then you slowly build confidence. You're not, you're not going to transform heart in this go-getting, highly confident organization until you demonstrate it over and over and over again. Right? And you start with smaller projects and you gradually build to more um, uh, ambitious uh, projects. But building success along the way will help uh, galvanize support for the future activities of HART. You know, I, in order to do that, Hart, I need to make sure HART has got the right skill sets within the organization to monitor and control. There's a lot of organizations, particularly uh, organizations embarking on projects that they've never tried before. They depend heavily on consultants. And consultants, trust me, are important. But you don't give the keys to your organization to a consultant. You have to have someone in the organization that understands what we're trying to achieve and has some basic understanding of how that uh, can be done successfully. Um, you know, I think that when you look at projects, you need to look at the expected revenues and the, the anticipated project expenses. Uh, I've worked for, on projects that had a, enormous budgets, and I've worked on projects that barely had enough to get the core done. Uh, and so, the, but your approach to executing projects is the same. Uh, you need to control cost. You need to be a guardian of the schedule. You need to make sure that you deliver scope. And you need to know what the scope is so that uh, you, you, at the end you didn't build this and spend money and not achieve the desired uh, outcomes. Um, prioritize investment and improvement projects in order of need and expected benefits. Why are you building it? I mean, seriously, why are you building it? All right? And you, you need to be able to define that. That it is going to increase ridership. It's going to serve as a, serve a neighborhood that has a vital need. Uh, we're trying to attract new riders. Um, why are we doing it? And is it worth spending the money that we're projecting that it's going to cost to do it? It's a common sense thing. It's just like what you do with your with your home. If you're going to put a new roof on, why are you putting a new roof on? Right. Uh, so um, you need to be pretty certain about what you're doing. And then develop a strategic plan uh, that 
that takes all your laundry list of prior of our projects, puts them in a, in a priority, attaches some anticipated expense to each one, and then you need to look at your financial plan and where can I shoehorn these work these projects in, uh, and so that you have a realistic uh, expectation for um, what you could do. Uh, before I, uh, before I left here today, uh, I, I thought it was important to sort of share with you some principles and values that I operate from. And some of the words that you're going to see, you've heard already today, because they are important words and they're important to me. Stewardship. Use public resources wisely and bent to the benefit of the community. Provide a good transportation value with excellent service, which is safe, reliable, convenient, and affordable. And, and do it right the first time. And that, that, that you, many of you heard me use uh, the following slogan, if you will, uh, cut a measure twice and cut once. Just do a thorough job, do it right the first time, and don't have to do it again because that's waste time, uh, it is expensive, and it erodes confidence. And so uh, stewardship is, is vital. Uh, customer service. Uh, address the needs of the customers with respect and on, in a timely manner. When you learn of a problem, uh, don't do a six-month study to fix it unless it's absolutely necessary. Respond. Go out and talk to them. And, and try to respond. Good customer service isn't the responsibility of a selected few in the organization that happen to work in the customer service department. Every operator is responsible for customer service. Every mechanic is responsible for customer service. The state of good repair of our facilities and our vehicles is good customer service. So a mechanic has got those responsibilities. Supervisors who release those vehicles on a day-to-day -day basis, those uh, supervisors who dispatch operators, making sure that the operators uh, dress properly and are properly trained and are pr properly assigned the right work for that day, that's all good customer service putting um, our customers' needs first. It includes technology. I don't feel that you go out and you buy technology for the sake of technology. The technology brings things. If you're, if you're a millennial, you live your life through your smartphone. You, you want to be able to buy your ticket from your cell phone. Uh, you want to look at where your bus is on your cell phone. That's examples of technology that help provide good customer service. Uh, transparency. Mr. Price, excuse me just a moment, but we're running over time now for your um, presentation. So if you wrap it up quicker, we could um, have a little bit more uh, board interaction with you. Absolutely. I tell you what, it was transparency, safety and security, um, respect in the workplace and uh, honesty and trustworthiness. You can read what I said. Um, they are all very important to me, and uh, uh, that's th those would be my guiding principles if I were selected as your next CEO. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much, and please forgive me for for breaking in, but we have um, I know we have one more uh, time certain today, and we're already um, uh, 20 minutes late for for her, and uh, she has a plane to catch. So I, I can't let this go any longer than, um, than we have uh, scheduled. So I appreciate your wrapping it up quickly. Um, I am gonna open the floor for board members um, questions or discussions. And, and while you're raising your hands, board members, um, I would ask you, Mr. Price, um, a question, a, a good question from our consultants uh, list, and that is, how have you included the principles of diversity and inclusion into your decision making and hiring and service uh, delivery? And and how would you um, in, uh, include these principles here at heart? 
Yes, ma'am. The uh, when we are hiring uh, to fill fill positions, one of the things I look for is the best possible talent. Um, you know, years ago, uh, we would seem to be drawing from the same source. We were we were interviewing the same uh, type of people. The, the talents that we were looking for, the skill sets, uh, it was as though almost every candidate brought the same thing uh, to, the, to the table. Um, I asked our, um, our HR department to, to go back out and advertise again, but advertise in different locations. Um, I went, I spoke to a number of universities in the area. Uh, we went to uh, traditional m minority schools uh, where instead of in, like Old Dominion University, we went to Norfolk State, we went to Hampton University, and we went in there and we talked about uh, transit uh, careers. Uh, a lot of our um, uh, <coughs> students that we talked to were looking for summertime jobs. And we always felt that, uh, and we had uh, uh, seasonal bus service along the beachfront in Virginia Beach. And so we uh, attracted uh, quite a few people from the universities to drive buses in the summertime. And it, uh, it's not an easy job to get, frankly. Um, you gotta have a, a clean driving record. Uh, you have to have a clean criminal record. Uh, you gotta be drug free and alcohol free. And you'd be surprised at how many people get screened out. But we brought it in and, and we were getting um, different people, different backgrounds, different skill sets uh, in, in the job. And uh, many of the, not, well, some of the, the students who came to work for us uh, made a decision to make um, transit a career. Uh, and uh, one person uh, was a driver for about five years, uh, became a supervisor uh, who ultimately became a manager and um, she has since uh, left the organization and she works in WAMADA now uh, with her husband. And so that's, that's one example of where we, we broadened the market. But one of the things that uh, we, we did with that one uh, particular young lady, we had a, su a summer season where we ran a, opened a bus division just for uh, the summer months. Uh, we gave that young lady uh, the opportunity to be a, a, a seasonal manager. Uh, she was a supervisor at the time. Gave her the... I'm sorry. Audio on Mr. Price. I'm so sorry. I'm sometimes thumbs. Uh, but we gave, we gave a young lady... Lost it again. It's not me. <laughs> We're using a powerful disinfectant on that mic. Okay, very good. Uh, she uh, was the interim manager. She did an outstanding job. Uh, one of the stories that uh, that I that I heard from a customer was a um, a, a man who had been to the beach with his family left his wallet and a towel. Uh, on the bench on in the bus and um, she remembered uh, the, or the bus operator remembered what hotel they got out at and she went uh, to the hotel uh, talked to the front desk clerk uh, said would you mind calling this gentleman down and uh, he, she gave uh, the, that that gentleman his wallet back and saved their vacation and so I'm you know, not that, that that particular behavior is unique, um, but it is an example of, of, of great customer service. It, w the act of letting, giving her an, ap an opportunity to shine uh, was the example of the uh, inclusiveness that we try to create. We try to create an environment where people feel important. They feel uh, empowered to act. They don't have to come permission to do things uh, and then we promoted her to the a manager uh, when we had a vacancy when an opportunity created so uh, she did an outstanding job 
Um, I don't know if you heard about in Virginia Beach, we had a huge concert that was called Something in the Water. And uh, we had uh, 100,000 plus people uh, that, that showed up. They, the only way to get to those venues was that bus service. And uh, this young lady managed that with the city. And it was very instrumental when she got an opportunity to get a more uh, prestigious job with a bigger uh, transit agency uh, that helped her, uh, propel her career. Thank you. Um, board members, any um, last questions for Mr. Price? Mr. Price, would you, is there anything else you would like to say to us or, or ask us before we wrap this up? I want to say thank you very much. I'm indeed honored uh, to have had an opportunity to uh, speak to you today. So thank you very much. I did want to say thank you to Lena and Danielle for making my life uh, so much easier the last couple of weeks. And I wanted to thank Ivan for driving me to and from the airport. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. We do have a great uh, um, crew here, a great bunch of uh, dedicated employees, um, every bit like the stories you are telling. Um, and thank you very much, Mr. Price, for taking all this time with us here today and uh, all along in the process and for making time to meet with each of us and for your interest in heart and helping us make heart the, the best we can and, and move into the future. Um, so with that, that will close this interview and we'll move to the next one with some of the usual disinfection process in between. Uh, this is Commissioner Overman. I highly recommend that if you need a snack before lunch, now is the perfect time to go and get it. That's your public service safety announcement. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Overman. I have a little snack here myself, and I encourage everyone to uh, try to keep your strength up.
There should be some. I don't know where they are. Though. Oh, there's some. All right, I see Mrs. Legrand being um, uh, situated, getting ready to join us. And um, I would just like to, on behalf of the board, welcome you, Ms. Legrand. Um, we are very glad you're here. We understand your schedule is tight. Um, we will We will try to accommodate this in a as timely manner as we can, but we want to give you all the time that was allotted. So um, you are scheduled for a 10 to 15 minute presentation and um, then some we'll have some time for follow up questions from the board or any questions you have for us. Um, I will just um, acknowledge uh, that you have met with all of us. So we all do know quite a bit about each other and um, you know a little bit about us. Um, so I'll just turn the floor over to you to start your presentation. Welcome and, and thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having me and I'd like to say good afternoon to all of you. Um, my schedule is pretty open, so do not worry about me getting out of Tampa. It's my objective to stay here for a very long time. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to start my presentation. So today I'm going to share with you my vision for the next 12 months. And it's really a vision that's focused on being strategic. I recognize that you know, the answers in most cases are already in the community in which you serve, but it's a matter of establishing trust and transparency you know, renewing the organization as an organization of excellence, and then creating a vision that everyone can, you know, buy into and support. So over the next year, my focus would be for the first 90 days to really deliberately spend a lot of time with building and establish, establishing trust and transparency. And that will continue throughout my tenure as a CEO. But for the first 90 days, that's really where I'm gonna spend a lot of time. From there, I would like to focus on renewing the organization and then creating a vision for heart for the future. So when I talk about establish, establishing trust and transparency, really what I'm talking about is giving people the opportunity to first get to know who I am. You can't trust someone if you don't know who they are. And it's important to me for people to know where I come from and why I view public mobility as a space where we really can improve the lives of the communities in which we serve. I'm a daughter of immigrant parents who came from Central America and the Caribbean for a better opportunity and a better life and future for myself and the rest of our family. I know firsthand growing up in New York, having access to public transportation allowed me to access all that my city had to offer. And as a professional spending my career in public transportation, I know through study and technique that if public transportation is designed appropriately, taking into consideration the public and the community that they serve, you can indeed change the quality of life for the better of your community. So to do that, I will communicate who I am, recognizing that my background may be different, but it's those differences that allow us to move forward together in a meaningful, sustainable way. I will also listen, and listen tirelessly and actively to the staff, inclusive of the mechanics, the operators, you know, the schedulers, the bus washers, the administrative staff, the leadership, listening to everyone internally in the organization, as well as our customers from the various diverse neighborhoods and communities in which we serve, and our stakeholders and partners. And the objective here is to listen for opportunities so that we can all move the organization forward. And then in order to engage trust and really be transparent, we must engage in conversations. And some of the conversations may be difficult and a little off-putting, but if we have trust and respect for each other, we can have these conversations. I thought it was appropriate to have this African proverb here on this slide, which states, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And my vision is for us to go together as a community as we go forward to building trust and transparency. But next would be to renew the organization within that first six month period. And that really means for us to take a moment and think about where we are as an organization and assess our strengths, weaknesses, 
opportunities and threats, and how we can really develop a plan to address opportunities for us to move forward in a sustainable way. It's important for us to build a team that understands what success means and how it's defined, and also to build partnerships with people in the community who can help us achieve our goals and our visions as we work tirelessly to re-envision or rebrand HEART as an agency of excellence. And also to build relationships with our customers and our community so that they know we're here listening to them and wanting to work with them to help them to access those amenities and services that will help better and improve their lives and their communities. And I'll also say that it would be very important for us through this process of building trust and transparency and working to renew the organization to attract the best and brightest that can support us to ensuring that our organization is as strong as possible. Remember, through the SWOT analysis, we would have identified where our weaknesses are. So that means we need to attract capable people who can help us overcome those weaknesses, as well as helping people to continue to keep us strong where we are already strong. Attracting also partnerships with partners that we don't currently have so that we can look at ways to find additional funding sources, possibly having public-private partnerships as we advance the program, as well as new customers to attract them to the great service that we're providing. There are several who don't know about the great work that's currently going on, as well as the plans for the future. And here is an opportunity to, opportunity to attract those folks as well. Within the first 12 months, really, after we are talking about building trust and transparency, we're continuing to do this, we're renewing the organization, continuing to take those steps of building a strong team, it's really creating a vision for HEART. And this vision is really focused on a couple of things here. First, advancing the immediate and long-term goals and objectives of the organization. We have to and continue to provide service to the community that we're serving today. But at the same time, we must be focused on the future and not lose sight that in order for us to continue to advance and grow, we have to be mindful of what the future looks like and how we can address the needs that the community is going to have. But then we have to formalize that plan and articulate it in a document which I'm calling the Strategic Mobility Plan. And that document should be all-encompassing, looking at operations, looking at facilities, looking at opportunities for transit-oriented development, it should be strategic, but also it needs to be a tangible job document that's tactical. So we actually have a plan on how we implement this vision. And it needs to be inclusive of the voices of the community that we've been engaging with over this period of time. So that at the end, we have consensus on where we want to go. And we know that our plan is grounded in the fact that the community wants us to take them there and we're working together in a partnership. And in order to implement this plan, we have to then take a look again internally to ensure that we are structured appropriately to actually deliver the plan. Do we have the right people in the organization? Are we organizationally structured to deliver on everything that's in the plan? And if not, we have to put a plan in process so that we can start to retool so that we're able to actually implement the plan over the 20-year horizon period. So. What I have presented here is really you know, something that may seem a little simplistic, but in my vision, I see this as being really the core of really moving an organization forward. First, you have to have trust and transparency, internally and externally, to build relationships with your partners in your community. Second, you have to renew the organization so that your staff and your team, one, understand the culture of your organization is based on success, trust, transparency, and respect. That they have a leader who's here, who's dedicated to them and their community, and wants to ensure that we're working tirelessly together to meet the community's needs. And then creating a vision that's tangible and measurable so that we can hold ourselves accountable and our community can hold us accountable for really being good stewards of their dollars, their time, and their respect. I've spent a career in this field. I have spent a lifetime working on challenging, pro challenging projects and helping communities to overcome those challenges. Also, I've worked to build great teams focused on success, as well as engaging with communities in a way 
that not only am I allowing myself to hear and learn from the community, but I'm giving them an opportunity to really shape the direction that we go in. I believe this background of my career for over 20 years has well prepared me to serve as the Heart CEO to go through this transformational time today. Thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to engaging with you in the Q&A. Well, thank you very much. Um, and um, I will be opening the floor to uh, board members for discussion. Um, let me kick it off by uh, asking a question uh, kind of similar to, I think, what uh, Director Williams was getting at earlier. Um, can you get a little bit um, more specific about um, how you would establish budget priorities and um, what you would look at in um, our area um, to to get started with, uh, given our our current state of affairs, and then and then big picture where you would go from here. I was uh, impressed when you and I spoke with your planning background, your planning credentials. And um, uh, so I, I would just like to give you a chance to expand a little bit more on the details of uh, where you think this, you might be able to take heart here in our community. Well, thank you. Um, that is a great question. and. You know, it, it is very timely. We are in a time when we recognize that the world outside is totally different today than it was, you know, the beginning of the year. When I walked in, I mentioned that this is my first in-person meeting and with all these screens, you know, either I'm a bank teller, but I'm not, and, but you feel that way, right? So, you know, how do we really address the budget and what are the plans for the priority? I would say there's a couple of steps. One, first understanding where the need is today. I recognize that the system is designed and was built for time before we had COVID. And I also recognize that the way people are traveling is different today than they were traveling several months ago. So for example, in most cases, transit is designed to take people from their homes to their job sites. And as we know, many people are working from home and those who have to go to work are the essential workers. But there are several other trips that may not be either available for them to take or we're not covering them the way that people would like us to cover. So I would say in order to really assess how we prioritize the budget, we really have to take a moment to really understand what the demand is and how we can supply service to meet that demand. So first and foremost, I would work with the internal team and the scheduling and marketing department to understand where we're seeing the concentration of demand understand where the community needs are, and then also understand what our budget is to meet those needs. And as we look to you know, redesign the system um, to make sure that we're being more responsive, that's how we can really prioritize where we spend our dollars. But it will take us some time to really you know, understand and assess where the biggest, not to use a cliche, but the biggest you know, bang for our bucks will be. And also ensuring that it's very important for us to have service to support the essential workers and the workforce that we currently have. But longer term, it's also looking at where do we wanna go as an agency as well as a county? You know, what kind of services do we need to provide? Where are we deficient now that we need to look into providing additional services? Equity is extremely important. We need to look at this through a lens, of, are we providing equitable service? And if not, what can we do to address that? So I would say that's another priority to really do some analysis and understand you know, how we are providing service through an equity lens, as well as as it relates to just the nuts and bolts demand that's out there. Thank you. And uh, Director Frazier, you are recognized. Thank you, Chair Smith, and hello, uh, Ms. Legrand. Good to see you again and speak with you. Um, when we spoke earlier, we had a very robust conversation about many different areas, including how integrated the transit system is into a community and how important it is that all those parts work together. And when I look back at your resume, you have an industrial engineering degree, which is the study of, of people and systems and how complex they can be and, and how to integrate them. How does that inform your industrial engineering degree, inform your style as a leader and what you would be looking to do as, as the CEO of this organization? So um, thank you for the, for the question and the conversation that we had during our initial interview. Um, 
You know, it, it's interesting because as I share with a lot of folks and colleagues in spaces that I'm one of the unique people who didn't stumble into transportation. I always wanted to be in this space. As you mentioned, my background is industrial engineering, which is really about process efficiencies and you know, human factors and really understanding how processes and people work together to, to create successful outcomes. And I think it's helped me to be successful in my space because you know, I look at everything through a lens of how can I make things better? And it's just intuitive. Um, plus, I have schooling that helps me find solutions. And I think in a lot of cases, especially you know, being in transit for a long time, I've been in this space for over 20 years, but for 20 or 30 years, you know, for the most part, things have been pretty much done the same way. right? And it's like you build a route, you have a system, people use it, um, you check your ridership numbers, you add more buses, the ridership goes up, you reduce it, it goes down. But it's really not looking at practically is it really the most efficient way to move people? And in this time, during COVID and post-COVID, with all of the conversation pointing to the fact that our future is gonna be different than our past, our immediate past, right? Just the last couple of months or maybe 12 to 18 months. This is really the time where my background, as far as looking at ways to be more efficient with the dollars and the budget that you have and finding sustainable solutions, I do this in my sleep. My, my husband tells me I'm always figuring something, right? But it's really about figuring out the best way to make improvements within your budget that you can see the fastest results. You know, the reality is the community doesn't have a long time for us to figure out how to make things better. They need to get someplace today. So if we take a long time and spend years, and I am a planner, a certified planner, so those planners out there hearing this don't cringe, but no one wants to read another planning document, right? So it's really about understanding how to move forward and doing it in a way that at least incrementally you can see changes. And then being you know, fearless enough to recognize if something doesn't work, it doesn't mean that you failed. It just means you need to try something else. And I think having a background in industrial engineering has prepared me to understand the nuance between something not working and failing. So I, I do believe that it's helped me in this space. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director McLean, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Adelie, uh, good afternoon. Nice seeing you again, too. Yes. And, and I do appreciate our conversation we had there. And I'm going to touch on that. Um, I asked the same or a similar question of, of two candidates already before, but I'm going to kind of synthesize it a little bit. Um, Tampa is a very vibrant, very active and, and growing community, um, and I will say Tampa Hillsboro, if you will. Um, so my question really is, is kind of twofold. Um, where do you see Hart playing a role in that, uh, of course, and that might be an easy one with your background and all. Uh, the other question I'll throw in there, too, is as we continue to grow, we're seeing pockets uh, throughout Hillsborough, whether that's um, West Shore or whether that's um, uh, uh, within, within the center of the city and then, of course, right here. Um, you know, we have a what I would call a fairly stable ridership, if you will. Even during this time, we have a fairly stable ridership, which most people don't. Um, understand uh, how do we increase that ridership and really I'm getting out to those choice riders that are out there and they have that option uh, of varying transportation methods they could use how do we convince them that riding on heart buses is the right right answer so thank you director McLean and um, you know you hit the nail on the head right it's the juxtaposition between you know your current customers and gaining additional market share if you will right um, you know, one heart's role in economic development is strong. You know, if, if you do research, the data will show you as you develop, if you have access to great public transportation, you know, your return on investment increases, you know, rapidly, faster than if you didn't. Most cities that have, you know, also increased their economic development in the urban core, you see that they also have great public transportation to complement that. Now, how do we go about attracting new customers, right? So, you know, part of it is marketing. It might sound simple, but, you know, if you remember Coca-Cola, and I'm going to date myself, they came out with the new Coke, 
right? Nobody liked the new Coke, right? So they went back to classic Coke, which was already, you know, just regular Coke, right? So they threw classic on there. I don't know if that was deliberate because the sales of classic Coke went up, you know, drastically when they got rid of new Coke and started talking about classic Coke. But again, it was marketing and branding. And it, it goes to heart too, it's a product. Right? We're offering a product to the community, and we have to market it and brand it as such. And then we also have to work with the developers and be deliberate. You know, if you're going to build these new developments, like in West Shore, you know, we need to have a conversation with them as they're planning that development to say, how are we going to link public transportation? How are you going to include this in your development? If you have a retail component, are you going to ensure that the people who live in these developments have access to you know, transit paths? Is that a part of their monthly fee for a homeowners association? There are different things that you can do to really market and brand what Hart can do. So that's one. And then. The other, I would say, and this is not only for heart, this is definitely an industry um, direction. You know, we have to look at public transportation to go beyond just the bus and the streetcar vehicles, right? It needs to be a comprehensive look at how people are moving. And the object objective is to have people move outside of in a vehicle by themselves, right? So our goal as a public transportation authority should be to get people out of single occupancy vehicles and get them to move either in a bus, on a streetcar, on a bicycle, on a scooter. So it's really integrating all of that and then helping people to understand, well, if you ride a scooter to this destination, then you can take the bus to this location and you don't have to drive. Or if you're going out you know, with some friends on the weekend, you're going to have a good time, you might have a couple of drinks, you, know, you can take you know, the bus from this location and get back home. And then maybe you can call you know, another vehicle to take you to your final destination because we don't want you behind the wheel. But Part of that is a campaign, right, to let people know how we can serve them in their trips. And again, as I mentioned earlier, all the trips are not from a home to work. And if you're talking about attracting new customers, customers who are not reliant on public transportation for their daily trips, we have to market our service in a way that they understand it's not just to get you from home to work. We can take you other places that you want to go, and you don't have to drive to get there. Thank you. Director Hudson, you're recognized. Thanks. Good to see you again, Ms. Grant. You're, uh, you have an incredibly impressive background, and, and I know in this industry it's, it's frequent that private sector experience is certainly in service of, of public sector organizations. And when we spoke um, earlier, I, I was interested in your experience in New Orleans in particular, where you mentioned that, I, I guess due to state law or something like that, your role really was in the role of, of, of working for the organization. And so I think I'd appreciate if you could maybe speak just briefly to um, why you're prepared now and comfortable with transitioning from a perhaps private sector uh, W-2 to a full-time public employee role. So thank you, um, Director Hudson. And you're correct, you know, I spent, I started off my career actually in the public sector. I worked for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. As I mentioned, I'm from New York. And then um, I moved to Georgia, I got married, and I started working for the Georgia Department of Transportation. And as you can tell, I have white hair now, so I'm on the other side of my career. So if you drew like a little bell, I'm on this end. And I think it's the right time for me to go back to the public sector, and I'm gonna tell you why. Um, I spent a good amount of time in the private sector, and I appreciate all the experiences that I had. I had the opportunity to work with several clients, several transit agencies over you know, 15 years to learn a whole lot. I think it's the fastest experience I've gotten to learn about so many things really at the same time. But now with that knowledge and understanding what's going on, and I'll be completely candid with you today, you know, there's a lot that's going on outside of COVID, right? There's social unrest, there's systemic racism. There's a lot that our communities are facing. And I feel that for me to work to really find change in our community, where I do believe wholeheartedly that public transportation is definitely a way for you to have immediate access to improve your life. And I want to do it and be clean and clear that I'm here to serve the public as a public servant, serving as a servant leader, to help people who look like me and people who want to work with people like me and serving the community and ensuring that everyone who is supporting funding, you know, our services has a leader who understands the value of what we're doing for the community. So for me, the best way to do it 
without anyone being concerned if I'm really here for the public or here to make a profit, I want to do it on the public sector side and I want to represent the people of the community. So thank you for asking that question. Thank you. Um, Director Vieira, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. It's good to see you. And ma'am, I, I really enjoyed our conversation that we had maybe a week and a half ago. Just a few things. I, I, I appreciated some of your comments with regards to our social realities. I think it's very important that our next um, uh, heart chief or CEO, um, as, as, as others have done in the past, by the way, this is not in any way a slight in anybody in the past. God knows that. But continue uh, to impress upon the public on how mass transit is an issue of social justice. It's an issue of economic justice, and it helps not just move people from point A to point B, but that point B could be, you know, picking up kids at school, daycare issues, uh, jobs, et cetera, that, that it directly ties to a, a lot of the things that we've been hearing about uh, for 500 years or the last uh, nine months or eight months, seven months in particular. Um, so just wanted to salute that. You know, one thing that we talked about, and I wanted to talk about this publicly is, with a math problem, so to speak, uh, in the next couple of years, months, what have you, d depending on what happens with the, uh, you know, all for Director Vieira, we're losing your audio. You may have to, Director Vieira, can you hear me? We, we lost your audio there for a minute. You may have, Director Vieira. Transportation. Can you hear me now? Um, you'll have to back up because we lost a good part of what you were saying. Well, you may have to um, dis disconnect your video because I think you're uh, having trouble uh, with the internet there is what it looked like. Yep. I'll just get to my question. Um, okay. my, my question is um, with regards to um, employee relations, we could have, you know, mathematical issues, so to speak, where um, we're, we're having challenges and it may pose a, a challenge to workers. Uh, tell us about your, you know, relationship that you foresee having with the hardworking men and women of, of heart, who are the, the heart and soul of our, of our organization, and uh, giving your background, your experiences, et cetera, um, how, how you could work with them and establish that trust. Uh, thank you, that's all. Well, it was good seeing you, and um, you know that's a great question. How do you build trust and get people to want to work with you? And and that's the way I look at it, right? You know, you have a job, and the reality is, the people who are working at Heart will have a longer tenure there than I would because they're working there now, and I'm not, right? So, they've worked for several other people, and why are you going to want to work for me? And what I would share is this. I understand that it is important for you to work in an environment where you're respected and that you feel like the people you work with and for respect you. And it goes back to the presentation about trust and transparency. It's not something that happens overnight, but it's something that you have to work at if you really want it to be successful. And that's who I am. I'm somebody who understands that People work hard because they want to work for you, not because of how much money they make or not because, you know, they're going to get a fancy watch when they retire. I don't know if they still give out watches, but you guys are the commissioners, so when I retire, I want to watch. No, but, um, you know, I don't know if people get watches any longer, but, you know, the reality is they want to be in a space. They're spending a lot of time away from their friends and family, and they want to be respected and treated well. And they want to know that their voices are heard. And that's why when I mentioned, you know, the first 90 days about listening and learning, it's a real thing. People want to know that you're interested to hear what they have to offer. They have solutions. They've been doing this for a long time. And you don't need the new person coming in saying, I have all the answers. I don't. What I do know is that I need everyone to work toward being successful. And that means that we have to recognize our differences and use those to find solutions that are sustainable. And what the team will know is that I mean what I say. They will see me. For example, I was here yesterday. I got to ride the system. I got a tour. 
I had the opportunity to work with several of the staff, the head of maintenance, Scott showed me the maintenance facility, Colin, the head of safety and security, talked to me about the safety program, helped me to understand how you came out of a challenge and use it as an opportunity to provide barriers on the buses for your operators, and they came in handy during COVID. Got to spend time with Ruthie in operations, as well as Crystal in human resources, again, to understand what they're working on. Saw the great training facilities, opportunities for people to learn more about their space and their field, as well as succession planning opportunities so people can grow within the organization. What I can say is that they will see me. I will not just be a title on the website. I went to the Net Park Transfer Center last night at 8.30 to see what the service looks like at night and got to see some of the customers. I rode the Route 6 bus to the VA hospital and got to sit with the passengers and talk to the operators and see what they're dealing with. So I'm just using this as an example to share with you that I'm out there. And I took the time to do that just for this one weekend. But this is where I will spend most of my time, especially in the first 90 days, so I can really get an assessment of what's going on in the system and build a rapport with the team. So. so Thank you. Uh, I've had a few hands up and then they dropped off. So I was wondering if that was a technical issue. If I don't call on you. Oh, yes, there they are. Um, okay, um, it, Mayor Castor, you're recognized. I'll make this very quick. Ms. LeGrand, and I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't think I could be more impressed than our conversation that we had, but apparently uh, you have you have excelled uh, even further than my expectations. So excellent interview here today. The question I was going to ask was along, along the lines of what Tyler Hudson asked about your, your private public uh, uh, experience. But one of the things that I was so impressed with was the way that you wove equality and inclusion into every aspect of your remarks, even uh, dealing with the budget, dealing with heart team members with the board, but most importantly with heart customers. And uh, I was particularly uh, impressed when you talked about how you didn't define riders as dependent or choice. Uh, they were your customers and, and you wanted to provide the, the best possible experience for every one of those. So I thank you very, very much for uh, coming here today. Thank you for applying for this position and I certainly wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Overman, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms. LeGrand, thank you very much for not only applying, but for the time that we spent together. I learned a great deal about you and also appreciate the, uh, many of the things that you've said today and the, and the diversity of the presentation that you've offered us. The key issue that I um, recognized in our call was the, the way in which you worked when you were in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, that, that experience working in a city that is actually experienced, um, you know, emergency management as far as uh, deploying to, for a hurricane, helping people move very quickly, understanding how that emergency can translate into best preparation and thought process for uh, not only how we deal with COVID, but should we, I mean, we live in a vulnerable community and, and part is an integral part of our emergency plan. Having that experience is, is very helpful in my opinion, but it also helped elucidate how, when we've talked about your public, I mean, your public experience and your private experience, looking at your consulting history, when you worked there, you worked as part of the agency, and I don't know that that's very clear. Could you could you talk about what we discussed as far as how your role uh, in the last you know nine or ten years has evolved over time, and what your what your position, uh, how you filled that position? Um, for the question, so I spent I would say um, the last twenty years. 15 years with AECOM, which was an engineering firm, and then the last four years I've spent with TransDev. I was hired away from AECOM to serve as a member of the New Orleans staff, the New Orleans Regional Transit Authority, NORDA's staff. Um, based on Louisiana law, the New Orleans RTA, 
they outsource all of their employees. So all 600 plus employees um, were outsourced, and but we worked 100% for the transit agency. We had to follow all of the state and city regulations as it related to all sorts of engagements. We hired consultants. Uh, we did procurement. We did purchasing. We did ethics. We did the state, state safety oversight. So I was a member of the New Orleans executive team. Um, I worked for the CEO, and he worked for the board of directors. And that was the arrangement in New Orleans since the 80s. I had people on my team who had worked there for 40 years. And you know they may have had different companies' names on their checks, but they were there for 40 plus years. Um, and it was a great experience. I had left the public sector where I was a consultant and worked for several different transit agencies to actually being in a transit agency every single day. And Director Overman is correct. We talked a bit about you know my first time going to New Orleans and being there for the hurricane season. And when you're on the executive team, you don't get to hide out in your house. You have to get out and get into the transit agency because it's a place where, you know, if there is an evacuation, people are going to come to the location. So as a member of the executive team, I had to be well aware of the emergency preparedness of our agency and also be present all the time, even if it was overnight in that organization. And then I was also responsible for building a team and maintaining relationships internally with the union, as well as the administrative staff, and then externally with City Hall and the, um, the commissioners for the city council, and, um, you know, and working closely with the leaders in the community. So it was my opportunity of recent, you know, within the last you know, four years of me actually serving in the public sector space. And I shared with Director Overman during our interview that, you know, I really like that experience. And that's why I have decided to throw my name in for a public sector job so I continue to serve in that capacity. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share that. Chair, I just have one quick follow up, if you don't mind, please. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so with that, one of the things that uh, actually our chair brought forward was, you know, your background in industrial engineering and planning. We m may or may not have a, a good um, outcome when it comes to the surplus, the surtax. And it's incumbent if we have to go back to referendum in uh, 22 in order to generate the resources in order to build the agency we all want and need in this community. What would your strategic plan encompass and how would you go about addressing the needs of the agency as it prepares for that in the event that that's our outcome? And I'll stop there. Mentioned it's deliberate and focused, recognizing that we're unsure of the fate of the surtax. So if we start with listening and communicating and engaging over the first 90 days and making it clear you know, what we're doing here, why heart is important to the community, and how it supports the foundation. As Director McLean asked in your question, you know, how is heart a part of economic growth? And a part of this is not only for me to get an opportunity to, one, introduce myself to the region, and also hear from the region and our customers internally and externally, but also for us to really start the process of marketing the value of heart and getting people excited again about moving and working together so we can get the funding that we need. So if that means that we have to go back in 2022, it is our job to start the process of letting people know, educating them on how the dollars will be spent, finding out if the plan that was presented is still where we need to put the resources, recognizing that the future that we're seeing now is totally different than it was in 2018. And you know, are there opportunities to, I would say, tweak a little bit on how we're going to spend the funds, where we need to you know, put the service, and what types of service do we need to design? You know, how do we focus on regionalism? How do we ensure that the urban core is being supported adequately? Are we sure that we have the right infrastructure to have bicycle lanes and pedestrian ways? You know, all of those conversations are things that we need to start having immediately. What we don't want to do is wait until, you know, it's time to put something on the ballot to start now introducing these concepts to the community. Let's take the time now to start it through this process. So that would be my approach. Thank you. Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Legrand, it was uh, great 
interviewing you and thank you for um, all the time and the application. I think we've had just really strong applicants and, and good conversation. Um, I know you were asked about your private sector, uh, your resume and all your private sector experience that you've had um, and, and now working um, also for um, a private sector company. I'm not asking about the past, but when you spoke, one of the things you said is looking at how you would have public private partnerships for the future at heart. And I'm just wondering what you're, what those would be and what you're thinking about when you say that. Sure, so in response to a question about, you know, really understanding our budget and funding opportunities, and then looking at, you know, the portfolio of offerings that were in the plan that was to support the surtax, you know, for example, I would say if we're going to have a transit-oriented development, there may be opportunities to work with the private sector or developer to help with that project. And if we were to build, you know, some sort of development or partner with them in a joint land use development where they build the facility or the building or the structures, and then we also work with them to build in some access for public transit, um, things like that. Those are um, public-private partnerships that they use in the public transit space. As well as, you know, I know there's some plans for commuter rail, you know, there may be opportunities, again, to work with the private sector, let's say it's CSX, um, as well as with the transit agency to look at ways that we can work together to advance the project. Um, there are all sorts of different types of funding strategies that they have that FTA, the Federal Transit Administration, allows you to work with in partnership to leverage the dollars you have. The reality is that, you know, just to use easy math, you know, if you have $100 and there's an opportunity to use 50 of those dollars towards the project and get some partnerships for the other $50, maybe you can use the $50 that you're not spending of your own money to advance something else. So really it's about looking at opportunities where we can leverage the dollars that we have to really build more within, you know, the, the confines of the regulations and what is allowed. So really that's what I mean when I talk about public pro private partnerships. And you know, there may be an elephant in the room and I want to be very clear and deliberate. It is not my intention, nor do I have the power if I was so fortunate to get the job to be CEO to look at outsourcing service at heart. That is not what I mean when I say public private partnerships. Heart is a public agency and I'm looking forward to working in a public agency and serving as a public steward. Um, there is no appetite for me, nor do I have the background or experience in outsourcing. Again, as TransDev, I was not in business development. I actually worked in a property, and that was my background to work in operations. So again, when I talk about public-private partnerships, it's really about how do we leverage the dollars we have to build more within the same time frame. So thank you for the question. Thank you, and I'm going to ask everybody to mute their phones when they are not uh, speaking. Councilman Vieira, oh, there we go. Um, thank you, and and thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for being willing to have a frank uh, conversation and and get into the details with us. I will tell you um, that we do we have not so far given watches to anyone on their way out, but we do have lovely crystal buses that uh, we present. And um, so I wish you luck there someday. Um, it, it, there, I see no more hands up, uh, but um, would you like to, um, would you like to just give a, a closing statement or do you have any questions for us, Ms. Legrand? Um, I will just give a closing statement because I know it's late in the day, but for you guys, you've been doing this for a long time. So one, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to present. I wanna thank you for being alert and engaged. I know it's been a long day. I've been on the other side, so I appreciate that. Um, I do wanna share that I have been so fortunate to get to engage with several of the staff here at Heart, as well as to talk with the operators and also some of the uh, mechanics yesterday. And I wanna say that you have a great organization that you are leading currently, and I would be more than fortunate to continue to serve you in working with HART to continue to advance the program that they have. So I want to thank you so much for this opportunity. And again, thank you for taking the time to talk with me. 
Thank you very much. And, and I will just um, uh, thank you on behalf of the board and um, thank you for taking so much time to meet with us here today uh, and, and to meet with a staff and ride the buses while you were here and uh, meet with each and every one of us board members for interviews. Um, we appreciate your investing uh, that, that time and energy into um, helping us uh, make sure that we are taking heart to the next level with our next CEO. And um, we wish you safe travels on your way home and um, uh, say farewell with that and, and move on. But thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, board members, let's see. We have uh, our representatives from GovHR on the call, Ms. Stevens or, or Ms. Katamartori, uh, do you have anything to add before we uh, move into board deliberations? No, I don't think I have anything um, that we need to add. Uh, we do. I guess I would say that uh, any decision you make, you uh, maybe uh, we need some time to make sure all of the background uh, in the backgrounding has been completed. So, you know, if you select a candidate, just make uh, you know in the motion, it would be that they're pending uh, their, the completion of their background check. Oh, thank you for that point. Um, and and let me say what I, I'm sure we're all thinking is that you have brought us really great candidates and helped us to um, uh, uh, refine the choice down to the four we have before us. And uh, I honestly, I feel like we can't go wrong um, today. You, you have really uh, done your work well and brought us uh, wonderful uh, candidates, um, our, our decisions from here um, will be happy ones, I'm, I'm sure, whichever direction we go. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity and also thank all of you for the time and the effort you've put into this. I know it has been lengthy today as well as over the last couple of weeks, the time commitment that you all made to have um, discussions with these four candidates. This is one of the most important decisions we'll make as a board, and um, I, we are all taking it very seriously and happy to uh, put the time into it. So um, at this point, board members, we will now move into board deliberations. <clears throat> and from this point forward, I will ask you to please refer to the candidate by their candidate number as listed in the agenda rather than their name. So in the agenda we have, and it's it's Roman numerals, and there's a bit of a typo on uh, uh, number uh, Roman numeral four, but what we have is candidates one, two, three, and four. And so if we will refer to them with those numbers, um, that might uh, be a little bit uh, more helpful in our discussion. I've been advised that the ideal outcome for today is for us to arrive at a top two candidates. So we have a clear preferred candidate plus an alternate if possible. And that way in our final motions, we can direct staff to negotiate a contract with our preferred candidate to bring back to our December meeting but if that contract fell through or that candidate withdrew for any reason, we could still hopefully have staff bringing us back a contract to our December meeting for the alternate without having to back all the way up to this point again to reconsider which candidate to bring forward sometime after that. So that would be ideal. We may not, we may not get there and of course the primary goal is to arrive at a clear preferred choice today. So what I'd like to ask you to try, since it worked so well the last time, is for each of us to identify our top two choices, noting your top preference among the two, a preferred and an alternate, uh, one and a two if you want, and, and see if that leads us to a clear board preference with an alternate. 
uh, keep in mind this process is it's just a process. It's just to try to discern the will of the board. So it's half discussion, half straw poll to lead us to a place where a preference emerges. And we can then get after that a motion to approve that preference. But uh, what I'd like to start out with is to recognize each board member in whatever order you raise your hands. You wanna listen a, a bit, feel free. You wanna hop out there, feel free. Um, so uh, each one um, give your top two choices, a preferred and an alternate, and then feel free to add comments about why you are making your choice. And as we go along, you may feel free to raise your hand again to change your choices after you hear some discussion, because the point is for us to arrive at some consensus. So if you see your candidate is not gonna make it, you may wanna move your choice to another for the sake of that consensus. All right, uh, um, I see some hands raised already. If there is um, any question about this process, um, sing out. Otherwise, I'll start with the hands um, doing what I just laid out. All right. Okay, everybody's everybody's uh, raring to go. Good. Commissioner Kemp, uh, you're recognized. Sorry, I didn't have my hand raised. It's not working again. Oh, okay. So, okay, great. Commissioner Overman, you're recognized. <laughs> Thank you, and I did have my hand raised. Um, first of all, I wanna say we would be totally blessed if any of the four were selected because um, every interview I had, I was like, oh, I fell in love with them. Oh my God, that is so awesome. They're just so terrific. It was just the, I've literally since Thursday, I've wrestled with this nonstop because we would be blessed to have any one of these four candidates take the charge and lead with the experience they bring to the table. But in wrestling and listening today, I heard things that I think will really matter to our organization as a whole. So with that, I um, am, I wish I could just throw equally to, uh, because I can't choose between the two of them at this point. And so I'm willing to listen, but candidate one and candidate four just bring to the table, in my opinion, both of them do a perspective that would serve us well and an experience that would serve us well. So I'm I'm hesitant to rank either one of them, one or you know, one or, or one number one and number two. That that is almost impossible for me to choose at this point. Uh, That's fine. But, but my choices are four and one for my first two. That's fine. And what I'll do is I'll put you down for ones for both of them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. uh, Councilman Vieira, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Um, I'll agree with Commissioner Overman. Uh, one and four, I, I think they both bring a lot to the table and, um, you know, very experienced. I, I, I like their, um, the way I would see them working with us, with other elected officials with the employees at heart and with all the stakeholders. And, and, and let me first say the obvious, which is that everybody brought something awesome to the table. Um, and, and, and everybody is, is just to be commended and heralded for their performance, et cetera. But for me, one, I pick being four um, over one. One brings a lot to the table. I think that four has the, um, the right combination of the skill set the vision, the personality skills, et cetera, uh, that, that, that we would want that would merge best with the job. Um, again, we're, we're looking at a lot of individuals who would, who are, all these individuals are in the top tier, but I think that four for myself is, um, uh, she's the one for me. So that's, uh, that's my pick. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And next is, um, I have to translate Corbin to Director McLean. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I want to echo the same sentiments as everybody. I, I thought all four candidates were superb, and, and I really did enjoy 
my conversations with them on the phone. Um, however, I was waiting for this interview here in person because I think everybody knows you can you can conduct an interview differently in the, on a phone and, and it's a little bit more relaxed than in person. So um, my votes are similar to everybody else's. Um, and, and before this, they weren't. Um, but right now, I'm looking at four and one, with four being um, the, the lead candidate. Um, and primarily because of this interview, I think they both bring a wealth of experience that we can use. Um, and, and they bring a wealth of understanding. Um, so I will go with four and one. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Schistler, you're recognized. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, say to, to GovHR, great job bringing superb candidates. It was great to, sp to speak with each and every one of them, and every one of them, I like like Commissioner Overman, yeah, this is it, this is it, this is the one. But uh, I, too, wanted to wait until, until today's uh, discussions, and I also changed my mind on one of them. My preferences is one and four. One primarily because of I'm a firm believer in coming up through the ranks and starting at the bottom and working your way up. There's a tremendous connection that's to be had with the entire staff and everybody all up and down through the ranks and heart that that person knows that the CEO has done that before and that connection is is a uh, to me anyway in my, in my philosophy is a is a critical uh, connection or c critical function that he's going he or she would bring forward. Um, number four, that way better, way way good performance than I was expecting. So, uh, but I, I still say one one and then four. Councilman Schisler, you froze. We have you at uh, one and four with one, your preferred candidate. That is correct. And while, while you get resituated, I'll check back with you in a minute. We'll move on to Director Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, I pretty much am going along with uh, everybody else. I thought I'll Candidate four uh, being the primary and candidate one um, being a close second. Uh, I think that uh, both would be uh, tremendous leaders in the uh, for the organization. And uh, I, I really like the uh, the conversation that I had with uh, candidate four uh, in the, the initial interview. I, I thought that she did a tremendous job talking about the the public private partnership uh, portion. Uh, that I know Commissioner Kemp had asked uh, some additional questions on. But the, the real big thing for me at the very end, uh, Mayor Castor actually brought up, were the way that she had the inclusion comments and the way she did weave those in uh, for her interview. And I thought I, I, she just, I think, is going to be a tremendous uh, catch for us if we're able to uh, possibly offer the uh, job to her. So, uh, so candidate four and candidate one would be uh, my decision. Thank you. And just to confirm, you had candidate one as your preferred. Candidate four would be my preferred. Candidate one would be the secondary. Okay. And um, uh, confirming Director uh, Schistler, now that you're back in the room, I have you as one and four with uh, number one, your preferred. I never left. Yes, one and four with one is my preferred. <laughs> yes, you never left, but... Um, in a way, you digitally left for a moment. Um, okay, uh, that brings us to Director One as uh, Director Frazier. Thank you, Chair Smith. Um, I too want to uh, reiterate that all four of the candidates were wonderful and our consultant did a great job with narrowing them down for us. Um, I too um, have candidate four as my top pick and candidate one as my second pick. And um, what I will say about candidate four that I, I felt during our interview and that I that was reiterated here today for me was that uh, throughout my career, um, particularly as an attorney, I've, I've found that it's one thing to have a technical skill set of and understand the ins and outs of position, but it is a, a special skill set to be able to 
coalesce and motivate a team um, to go in the direction that an organization needs to go. And I think that's so critical um, what we're going to need with this incoming CEO and I believe candidate for um, with her, her background and uh, just an intangible passion that she has, that she exhibits, I think um, has that quality in spades. And so she's my top pick. Four is your top and uh, one is your alternate. Is that correct? That is correct, Chair Smith. Thank you. Okay. Um, Let's see, and I'm sorry, I have to decode some of these names. So, Director Hudson, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my primary is candidate four, my secondary is, is candidate one. You know, I, I can imagine scenarios where I think any of these candidates would, would be the best choice, but I think the scenario that, that most corresponds to the, the reality that Hart uh, faces today is the one that I think candidate four is, is probably best equipped uh, to confront. Um, and so again, great, great job, everyone on the consulting team. I think they are all great candidates, but um, it's, it's on us to make the hard decision. Uh, and for me, again, I think candidate four is, is best suited and my um, close number two would be candidate number one. Thank you. Director Williams, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, I too was uh, torn between candidate one and candidate four before I came into the room today. And I, just as uh, Director Schistler said, there is something to the fact that you start from the bottom and then you work your way up through the organization. And then when I heard um, Ms. Adelie Legrand today, she talked about inclusion. She also talked about uh, things that were forward thinking and that's where we uh, need to be. So my recommendation at this time would go with number four as my priority and number one as my second. Thank you. Um, Mayor Castor, you're recognized. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's all been said. Excellent candidates. Uh, number four, head and shoulders above is my number one. And I guess I'm a little different on this, but both in the personal interview and in today's presentation, I thought that number two uh, did an excellent job and would be uh, excellent at moving the organization forward. Thank you. Um, uh, Director uh, Kemp, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank HR Gov. This was a hugely different process than we had before and it was wonderful. I, I also want to thank you, Chair. I think you did a great job throughout this process of facilitating a great and open discussion. and. Um, um, I'm one who very much appreciates that, uh, whether we come to an agreement or disagree and respectfully disagree or learn from it, that's that's great. Um, I, and I do wanna say, we did have really strong, strong, very good candidates, all of the candidates. Um, I was very, very impressed. And I'll, I do have a little bit different take and it did, change over time from what I maybe thought at the uh, beginning of the process and later. Um, but I also um, found um, number two um, to be incredibly compelling with a really detailed presentation, but also um, very taken by, um, I think the depth um, in terms of uh, land use, in terms of um, planning and uh, in terms of how a personal kind of uh, organizational structure, uh, relationships moving the organization forward. It, especially today, actually created um, a real vision for me about how um, the organization uh, could move. So I'm, I was really, I'm very enthusiastic about, I know it's not the, the choice of the group, but uh, very enthusiastically support number two would have been my, um, top choice, but I know that that's um, not going anywhere. I also want to say that number four, um, I think is very excellent. Um, I'm very comfortable with the answers to my questions because I do uh, not want to be privatizing any services that we already offer. Um, uh, our, you know, I can see privatizing or having private partnerships in services that we don't uh, do um, currently. Uh, in fact, that would make sense. Um, but uh, 
the uh, I, I thought she has a real depth and fluid um, grasp and I care as both of them, I think very much addressed um, equity um, as part of their presentations. And I thought both of them were very, very strong. Um, number two, as I said, would have been my first choice, but I can see that that's not going to uh, uh, fly. I still would want that person to know that. Uh, and number four. Thank you. Director Knight, you're recognized. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, my choice, and, and again, uh, thank all for, you know, the four interview. I thought they did uh, real well as also. Uh, but my choices would be uh, four and two. And uh, even though, I mean, four and one, excuse me, four and one. And I'll go with four as the primary. And I did discuss uh, one of my main concerns is also like, uh, I really appreciate uh, one working up the ranks. Um, also, uh, you know, had some, uh, you know, experience in uh, uh, with the union and part of the union, uh, the staff and everything. I want I wanted to make sure and also at four that I uh, touched on that and uh, was uh, receptive as far as. Uh, sharing with the, I don't care, the lowest person in the company on up to the COO that uh, give a, a good relationship. Uh, look out for the safety, the well-being. We talked on diversity and inclusion and uh, like both of them and they all both agree, but I would go with four as number one and number one as my second. Okay, great. And um, now I will just say, um, and so that our um, uh, our consultant can convey um, how close this was, um, I will just say that uh, number two would have been my first choice because of some of the things we brought out in the um, discussion. I was just very impressed with candidate number two. Um, I am thrilled to be seeing what our choices are because uh, it looks to me from the scores I'm keeping that number four um, is gets uh, first choice for almost everybody and where she's not a first choice, she's a very, very close second as she is with me as well. So um, if, what I would like to ask here before we um, ask for a motion is: Is there any other? Is there any other discussion? Um, any anyone wants to um, add anything to the discussion? Um, I'm I'm just really pleased with with this board and how we've been working together. Um, so at this point, I think um, it's appropriate to ask for a motion um, to direct staff to uh, to work uh, to work with our consultant well I guess we direct GovHR and our general counsel to negotiate an agreement with the preferred candidate um, moving to an alternate if necessary and incorporating you know all of it contingent on the um, the screening process that um, uh, Ms. Stevens mentioned at the beginning. Um, so bring that back, uh, for the board to consider at its December meeting. Looking motion to approve as proof as I'll second right. that. motion from director McLean, second by, uh, commissioner Overman and, um, I have, I have a question. yes, who had a question? Uh, commissioner Overman, I have a okay. question. question. Um, I, I'm, I'm hearing what we're talking about. And so uh, the steps, just to get clear with the consultant, is that we finish the background check and then we uh, identify contract terms and that, com that comes back to the board for presentation. Is that how that works? 
correct. And we would be working with your general counsel uh, as well in that process. Okay. I, I just wanted to make sure I was clear because I, I would imagine that that contract terms still need to be worked out mm -hmm. as part of this process. So that it, dependent on how well those go, um, we'll move to approving a contract at the next board meeting, correct? Correct, yeah. Our, the goal, I think, and the intended timeline is that we would have that um, for you by your December meeting, but you're right. It, it does depend on how well that goes in identifying the terms and how um, amenable, you know, the candidate is uh, to your terms as um, as well as you are to the candidate's request. Excellent. Thank you very much. And this is Julie Mandel. We'll go ahead and work with, with um, the consultant to, to move forward with that process and, and look at starting at terms that are consistent with and similar to previous CEO contracts so that there's at least some understanding of the parameters. Right. We, right. Um, is there, so we have a motion on the floor by Director McLean, second by Commissioner Overman. Is there any other discussion about the motion? And um, let's take a roll call vote. Good afternoon. This is Danielle. Mayor Castor? Yes. Director Hudson? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Kem? Yes. Director Knight? Yes. Director McLean? Yes. Director Overman? Yes. Director Schistler? Yes. Chair Smith? Yes. Director Fraser? Yes. Director Vieira? Yes. Director Williams? Yes. Unanimously, thank you. Well, my goodness, I, uh, I couldn't be um, happier and, and more proud of um, our consultant and our staff and our board. Um, and, and please, Ms. Stevens, convey our, our great thanks to all the candidates for our, their willingness to um, go through this process with us. I, um, I know that uh, we are all feeling that heart is on the verge of a new day. And I, I think we have all of us a lot to be proud of um, moving through this process so, so quickly with a lot of hard work through challenging times and uh, technical challenges. Um, so thank you very much, Ms. Stevens. Is there anything you'd like to to say as we uh, move to the next step? Um, I just I want to thank you for the opportunity that we had to work with you. Also want to thank your staff, Lena and Crystal and Danielle, were extraordinarily helpful to us, particularly over the last couple of weeks as we tried to work through all the challenge, all the logistics, and all of the scheduling. And then um, I don't know if Joellen, you'd like to add anything. Um, else, but again, we've really appreciated the opportunity to work with you, and I'm glad that you felt that you had some strong candidates. Yes, thank you. And, and Charlene said everything very well, so thank you very much, and we're very happy that you're happy. Thank you, Ms. Katamatori. Um, you've got a great team there, and you have are you have served us well. You're continuing to serve us well as we uh, go through this last um, step. So thank you very much. Well, board members, that was really great work, but um, we have a little bit left to accomplish on this agenda. Um, and uh, we got a little longer than we meant to in the beginning. So we are still on item nine in our agenda. And I encourage you to just turn your screen off and eat <laughs> as we move through the rest of it. All right, um, find my way back up in the agenda to number nine. Oh, yes, this is um, an action item for the board, so I hope. I just want to remind everybody that we have to have a physical quorum in place here for us to continue to conduct business. And so I don't know that we... I think right now we have that, but if we lose any more members here, we're going to have a problem. So I just want us to know that going forward. Thank you. Right. Our um, next action item um, is uh, uh, the proposed service modifications. 
Ms. Mandel, can you tell by visual count or do we need to take a roll, roll call to make sure we still have a quorum present? Danielle, I think you, you have, uh, we did lose one member who's physically present. I don't, so we're, we're okay here. I, I don't think we need a roll call vote at this point. We will when we start taking actions. Okay. Um, Mr. Justin Willett, Senior Planner, and Donnie Murray, Senior Community Engagement Specialist, will give us a presentation on the 2021 proposed service modifications. You're yeah, recognized. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Uh, Justin Willett's here with Donnie Murray, and I'm going to get right into it and respect everyone's time. Um, I'm a Senior Planner in the Service Development Department. Donnie Murray is a Senior Community Engagement Specialist, and we're just going to give you a brief overview of the service changes proposed for January 2021 that most of you have seen many times. So we've condensed this presentation and we'll get through it quickly and then have some additional backup slides if we need to revisit any of the recommendations for further review. Next slide. So we'll do a quick little background and then uh, give you a high level overview of the changes. And then Donnie will step in and talk uh, more extensively about our public input and our outreach and the community involvement we did. And then we'll give some time for Q&A. Next slide. And next slide again. So a little bit of background here. Um, our goals at the outset of this were to align demand based on ridership from pre-COVID, but also factoring in where our ridership uh, remained fairly steady across the network. Um, focus on safety and efficiency and review operator comments and community concerns, and then to maximize our resources to plan for uncertainties surrounding the surtax, uh, future funding levels, and the pandemic that we're uh, within. Next slide. So our timeline, we got the results of some technical work in June of 2020. Uh, we got board approval to begin outreach in July. We got public input through August, from August to October. And we had our public hearing on October the 7th um, from 5.30 to 7 with a uh, physical presence was, we did arrange for that, but we did not have uh, any in-person in attendance, which was fine considering the pandemic, but we did wanna provide that opportunity at Marion Transit Center. We've got the board of directors approval. Hopefully we'll get that today. And the changes will be uh, tentatively scheduled for January, 2021. Next slide. So some of the additional changes that we're moving forward with um, we are continuing to move forward with a reduction in frequency on Route 6 and 34 from 15 to 20 minutes, reducing frequency on Route 46 on Brandon Boulevard, uh, modifying uh, a minor schedule change to Route 25 LX to stagger it more evenly between the 360 LX that's hourly from Brandon to McDill, um, reducing frequency of trips on the 24 LX from 5 to 3 in the morning and PM peaks and then removing routes 20X and 75LX. Um, also removing four of the five flex services and partially replacing uh, several of them, uh, except for town and country. Uh, some new revisions from the first phase of outreach is that we, are, uh, we were proposing to reduce the frequency on routes one and 400 Florida and Nebraska avenues. Uh, we have since revised that to keep them at 15 minute frequency during the weekday. Uh, we've modified routes 9 and 16 just slightly. Route 9's modification will be from Ebor into downtown, and Route 16 is going to turn around in the Sulphur Springs area just a little bit differently. And we have proposed to keep the Hart Flex South County until staff can come up with a better solution for Sun City Center and the Wamama area. Next slide. So, uh, high level, we've adjusted a handful of routes. Uh, we've added service on Cyprus with Route 10. It's a completely new route. Uh, it is very similar to an old route. It just serves West Shore a little bit differently and does not have service to the Social Security Administration. We will now serve that in both directions with the combined Route 30 from the Northwest Transfer Center and from downtown. Um, we have extended Route 14 further south into South Tampa to Britain Plaza. We've extended Route 38 uh, out Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard down Parsons Avenue to the Brandon Mall. And we have uh, added a new Route 44 to the community north of Fletcher to reconnect the University Area CDC and several communities uh, between Florida Avenue and 22nd Street. 
We have proposed to reduce the 275 LX to a weekday pattern just downtown to the university area in Wiregrass, and then the weekend pattern just on Bruce B. Downs from Wiregrass to university area. We've uh, continued with the plan to reduce frequency on Route 6, 24 LX, 33, 34, and 46. And then we are still proposing to remove the service I noted on the previous slide. Next slide. Um, this is the proposed system map. Uh, I know it's a little bit small, but you can see in green our frequent service network of 15 and 20 minute routes. Uh, the blue routes are all 30 minute frequency for the weekday. The purple are hourly. Uh, some of those are local, some of those are limited express. And then the orange is peak only express routes, 24 and 25 LX. Next slide. The financial impacts uh, we're currently estimating um, are around two to two and a half million dollars per year by the purely the reduction in annual service hours based on the marginal cost of service at $65 an hour. We're reducing our peak vehicles between flex and fixed route by 21, which is approximately 12%. And as you can see, about a six and a half percent reduction in annual service hours. Next slide. And now I'm going to hand it over to Donnie Murray so he can talk through some of our engagement efforts. Great. So my name is Donnie Murray. I'm the Senior Community Engagement Specialist. I'm going to go over the feedback we received and then just in general how we made the community aware about the opportunity to come in. Next slide, please. So in general, we had multiple avenues for the community to submit feedback, both physically and digitally. And our main approach really to get that on the ground feedback was through our in-person events at transit centers and our transfer centers and through our virtual meetings as well. Next slide. So we broke it down kind of into two different phases. Our first phase was between mid-August to mid-September, where we went into specific areas that we knew we had some different scenarios for different routes. We had a survey available during this phase one. So we looked at some areas and we wanted to make sure we could weed out some initial adjustments that might be needed and to discuss the routes with those different scenarios. So we hosted some virtual town halls, both in English and Spanish, and then went to our major transit and transfer centers at various times of the day, both peak hours and then off peak, reaching people of all times of the day. Next slide. So looking at phase one feedback, Justin and his team made those revisions to the plan. There was quite a few routes that he made some minor tweaks to based on that initial feedback. So then we took that refined plan more broadly onto the community, visiting more transit and transfer centers, holding additional English and Spanish town halls, having those flyers in English and Spanish at those transit and transfer centers and available online, and then holding that final public hearing that was both in person and online. We also made sure that that public hearing had a call-in feature. So for people that didn't have internet access, they could still participate listen in. Next slide. And in general, we wanted to make sure that people again knew about that they could submit a comment on these feedbacks. We wanted to hear what the community had to say about the services that they're using. So we used a combination of digital assets that Hart has, for example, all of our online sources, social media, phone apps, and things like that. We also utilized our in-person places at all of our transit and transfer centers, so a lot of physical locations. And we made sure that we broadcast the information to the media, to the community, to our partners and stakeholders. Then also made sure that we were reaching writers across the county, writers with limited and online access, and then um, diverse populations as well. So we made sure to focus on newsprint ads. We made sure to focus on urban and Spanish radios as well. Next slide. And of course, another component is making sure that we listen to the feedback from our um, employees as well. So we talked to employees multiple times and opened up online channels to hear their feedback as well and talk to them about some um, extra extra work to see heart through. Um, so I hope everyone in, in, in heart is feeling as, as optimistic as we are today about, uh, turning a page and, and moving forward with, with, uh, great new leadership. I'm really pleased. Uh, many thanks to Danielle, Arthur, and Lena Pettit, and also to our county, st uh, technical staff, um, James Brewer, as always, and, um, and Mr. Dan, who started us off today. Um, Thank you for for getting us through this first hybrid meeting. It uh, it all worked very well. We got a lot of important work done 
So, um, but I think that that is all we have for today, and we can Much adjourn. Much adjourn. <laughs> yes, let's adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, stay everyone. Safe. Thank you. So long, everyone. Thank you.